Hello and welcome to the weekend. Are you up to your elbows and contrast paints yet? Right, just before we get stuck into the show, I want to let you know that we have our last tickets available for the 40k hobby weekend. Kind of like a boot camp, but a lot more hobby. So, we have two kinds of ticket. We have the visitor ticket, where if you want to come here and actually participate in the show and the making of everything, you can pick that one up. And we also have a digital ticket. So what's the weekend about? Well, it's kind of pitched that people who have maybe always wanted to get into 40K or have maybe fancied starting a new 40K army. So each of those tickets contain one of these cool start collecting boxes. You can pick any of the ones of your choice, including some of these demon, demon jobbies, okay? They've actually been quite popular. Dual play, you see. Yeah. As well as that, for the, the folk that arrive here, they're going to get their choice of primer. They're going to get vouchers towards paints. Um, they're going to get um, uh, t-shirts, custom handmade t-shirt just for the event, custom dice bag made just for the event, and some custom objective markers that me and Justin are working on at the moment. And with the digital ticket, this is our new kind of experimental thing, so that wherever you are in the world, you can participate as well. So with the digital ticket, you'll be able to get your start collecting box, and you'll be able to pick up the t-shirt the and the dice bag. But it kind of goes beyond that. We haven't worked out fully what the plans for the digital are, but we're expecting you'll be able to update a Project Live blog over the weekend of what you're doing, which we will dip into during the whole weekend and show people what, what the, the wider community is working on. We also intend to run some live streams and some live chats. And then we have a cool prize. So what we're doing is we are... Um, uh, a winner within the actual visitor center and a winner out, you, uh, out among you guys with the digital ticket, we're gonna send you a chainsword kit. So we've been playing around with uh, building a chainsword and this is our 3D printed chainsword. Whoa, I feel epic. And what we're gonna do is one of you guys is gonna be master of the forge. So we're gonna have two of these that we're gonna give away and we will update you more on how to do, on how you could be in with a chance of winning a chainsword kit that we will ship out to you and then you can put together and then you can send us a picture of you looking as awesome as I do. Now, hobby weekend, it's gonna be more hobby focused. We're bringing Thomas Menes into the studio for the hobby weekend. Thomas Menes does the Thomas Mini mashup uh, show. It's absolutely fabulous. If you've never watched it, come across, join backstage. It's all about conversions and working with green stuff. He's got these amazing tutorials on how to do things like bolter fire and flames and stuff. Mwah, epic, but he's going to be here advising us and helping us on things that we can be doing with our armies. So the bulk of this is all going to be set up with people taking into new armies for the first time and us sharing our ideas and sharing our experiences and really just having a really good hobby weekend. However, Apocalypse is here as well. So this side, we're going to do gaming tables. And I'm thinking we're going to go apocalypse. I have some ideas. It's a little bit early to share them. But yeah, stay tuned on that. Because I'm thinking of something rather massive for this. And it could be very cool. But first things first, let's get on with the show and find out what's happening with apocalypse. <laughs> It's like 2010 all over again, Ben. Apocalypse <laughs> is here. It's, all, it's always just around the corner. <laughs> oh, man. Do you know what? I remember the first time round that Apocalypse yes. uh, came about. And thanks to Ronnie Renton, by the way, because <laughs> the, the, the fan, man... Fan is, of everything on the table at once. Yeah, the yeah. man deserves credit because the initial kind of whole Apocalypse thing, so I'm told, was yeah. Ronnie Renton's idea uh, that, that Ronnie uh, wanted super heavies and basically said, look, we need a way for everybody to get everything they own all <laughs> on the table. And yeah, Apocalypse, yeah. Apocalypse was born. Yeah. And we're here again. But I've got to say, I think that this this new 
execution of Apocalypse is looking much more promising than the last one. The last one was great in principle, but man, it was a pain in the ass to play. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, that, I mean that was one of the things with the old one is that effectively, while it was Apocalypse and it was on a grand scale, it was still you're playing 40k, you know, using those kind of standard rules that we'd all sort of seen before on the tabletop. Every the, game lasted three days. <laughs> exactly, yeah. With, with the new version of this, they've tried to make it so it's a lot easier to play. I think they said they want to try and get it down to like the regular time of sort of like a standard tournament sort of game, so about two hours, something like that. Because um, everything's now done, not necessarily just on the squad level, uh, but done on like a detached attachment level so entire wings of your army activate and oh, do everything and stuff at the same I time love it. so i love it i also love the fact that um there are bucket loads of dice oh yeah and yeah. custom dice oh, yeah. i have a wee thing for custom dice i don't know where that came from but i i have developed a thing for custom <laughs> dice look at them just look at them how does anybody not want to own those <laughs> well d12 oh it just they're just uh, they're just epic and I, I can't believe this. We have movement trays. Yes. Yeah. Movement trays for 40 characters. <clears throat> that, that. that must make you feel... That must take you right back to your grognard, grognard heart of... Oh, oh God, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> everything is better on movement trays. <laughs> but, but I see they've made the rookie mistake of making flat movement trays, which uh, aren't going to go over terrain. No. 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 No, they should have taken a leaf out of our book. Yes. 3D, 3D movement, movement trays. Of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that is the way of the future. If you've got hordes of miniatures trying to get over hordes of terrain, yes. you need hordes of 3D movement trays. 3, 3D movement trays is, is absolutely the way to go. <laughs> um, we, will, we are licensing the idea at the moment. <laughs> so a, anybody the, wants fact that, the fact that we stole it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> we do. We merely took his initial idea and improved upon it. We, we, we improved on it immensely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What else is, uh, is part of the release? So you get it. Uh, right. So talk me through everything I need to buy to get involved in this. Okay, so the main thing is that core box set that you can see at the top, at the top there of the uh, of the article. That is the sort of core thing that you need to get. That includes the rule book and the manual and all that kind of thing. It includes all the tokens that you need and all of the command cards as well that help you sort of play through your games, set up scenarios and that kind of thing as well. In addition okay. to that, they've also got things like that dice set which you can pick up, which is, you know, sort of, that's the like flashy one. It, the, the actual box set does come with some cool D12s and stuff in it anyway, but they're just black and white. The other ones that you see there are the like slightly more high class versions. They're the ones we want. They're the ones yeah. we want. I, I yeah. can I can see gigantic yeah. apocalypse tables being covered <laughs> in those. I like that. Yes. Beyond that, the yeah. other cool thing that you'll need is you'll need all your new data sheets for your armies. But yes. instead of them being as part of a book or like a faction specific book or whatever, they're all going to be completely free to download when apocalypse hits. So Ooh. whether or not you're playing Tau, Tyranids, Orcs, Space Marines, whatever, all of the data sheets that you need to play apocalypse will be free for you to download in PDF form, so you can just use them immediately and start playing games. That's good. Yep. The only other thing you're going to need is you're going to need either, well a big table, obviously, but also some additional models. Um, so they've also put together a whole bunch of apocalypse deals mm -hmm. uh, that are potentially going to be limited i would imagine on their web stores they normally are yes. but these are sort of a, known as apocalypse detachments that allow you to add a huge big chunk of stuff to your army uh, the space marine one's very much more of like a core sort of style set one because it comes yeah. with lots of troops you've got a dreadnought in there and you've got a captain as well but some of the other ones we've just sort of seen a little bit of smattering of them here in this article um show off things like just a bunch of monsters or a bunch yeah. of vehicles and all that kind of thing so it's kind of like that little little additional step you need to do if you want to try and sort of upgrade your army to the apocalypse level yeah uh, but yeah there's no sort of like in-depth stuff just right now about exactly how big these armies are or how those armies come together but i'm sure there's going to be, be some more stuff over the next couple of days next couple of weeks as apocalypse ramps up as they sort of look a little bit more in detail at it on yeah. their uh, blog so yeah um i've got to say i've been looking at the battalions we always do don't we we just we look at these uh, these battalion boxes and we think <gasps> and, 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 and 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 you know uh, for apocalypse some of them are some of them are really really well thought out like the tyranid one the orc one they're adding a lot of the kind of the big stuff yeah. that you you would chuck into a game. Mm -hmm. I personally find the Space Marine one really underwhelming because what could have been really cool in the Space Marine one would have been something like um, Three Vindicators, mm. you know, the, the line breaker kind of a thing, you know, bringing in some of that, that, that kind of heavy stuff. I don't know if it's me, but it almost feels like they're just trying to push more and more of the infantry yeah and even having when you compare that to the orcs 
and the orcs is just filled with killer cans and, <laughs> death, yeah. and, and death dreads and that sort yeah. of thing. Why have they not got buckets of centurions and dreadnoughts in the Space Marine one? Yeah. Why have they not gone the same way, whereas they've just gone, it's essentially it is more of the same. It's 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 practically no different than picking up the non-apocalypse yeah. starter set for it's, the Primaris. You know, it's fine. The, the, space, the Primaris don't have a start collecting set at the moment. Oh, so well, that's, that's I, probably why I, then. They're is, just bridging the gap. I would imagine that this is, this is kind of a yeah. bridge product. But um, I've got to say, you know, um, I, I find it a bit tame. I find yeah. it, you know... I, a, a bit disappointing because you know the apocalypse is an opportunity to start seeing units fielded that we wouldn't normally yeah, see r- ridiculous things in a, in a, in our gaming tables you know so uh, so i rarely see people fielding vindicators these days you know so you know getting the vindies out there mm. and, you know a big group of vindicators you know uh, so if i was designing the box i'd maybe put some vindicators in there like you maybe a couple of dreadnoughts mm. in there you know i'm sure that there's I would have went possibly one step further. I would have just went, have all the dreadnoughts. Yeah. Go, here's your command dreadnought, which would be the venerable. Here's your librarian dreadnought for some psychic power. And then yeah. back it up with three other dreadnoughts. Here's a five dreadnought section oh. with with whatever else you want to chuck in afterwards. Yeah. They've done it with one, the Monster Mash, with the Nids. Yes. No. One of the, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. These may not be the only ones that are coming. Yeah, yeah. The there'll probably be more. Yeah. You know. Oh well, no, I, I don't. I, I don't think there'll be any more battalion box sets come out for Apocalypse. I, I would be surprised because that's. It, it's very. It, it's the generic Space Marine. Yeah. So, I I think they may squeeze another one out, or possibly a couple with the um, some of the other chapters. You may see a Space Wolf one, or they may tailor it that way. They may go, "Here's your generic Space Marine, yeah. whereas here is a Death Company." for mm-hmm. Blood Angels with loads of Death Company stuff, Death Company Dreadnoughts, Death Company know. everything. I think I I, I think yeah. I'll be surprised because I think in terms of the way that they've they're they're handling the releases, the releases are um fairly fairly predictable and fairly self contained. Hmm. Uh, I think what we will see is that there will be a very limited amount of stock of this stuff. Yeah. It will come out and that will be that. I don't think we well, see. Uh, so let's think. Uh, I'm trying to remember back to the days of Apocalypse. So uh, you know, the first Apocalypse we had Apocalypse, and then wasn't it after that we had like Planet Strike and stuff came out. There were other kind of, and there was Apocalypse Reload, I think, as well. Yeah, the, the point, first so. Apocalypse was just the rulebook. Yeah, and I, and I had no no additional backup. There was nothing mm-hmm. like this. Um, and then when they did the second edition of Apocalypse, there were other things coming, but. Planet Strike, Cities of Death, those were woven in any way into 40k. Yeah. Um, and then when they, they, they did the Apocalypse Reload, that was just pulling some of the um, newer releases that hadn't been covered in the second edition of Apocalypse, because this is third. Yeah, it's exactly so, third. So yeah, it's, the, the thing I was going to actually say on the the point of the sort of uh, the maker of that Space Marine one, the Primaris one, in compared to some of the others, is that I think one of the things they were talking about, I think it was in the article where they first announced Apocalypse, is that you um, they were trying to do it so that when you looked at an Imperial army, for example, you saw it as just that. So it was an army of the Imperium rather than just a Space Marine force. So I think maybe they came at it from the approach of, obviously, they probably wanted to try and sell more primary Space Marines. But I think maybe they were thinking that can be the core of it, and then you can use things from your Imperial Guard force, for example, to sort of build on and add to it with the sort of like slightly more mechanical side of things. Yeah. Things same with like Adeptus Mechanicus and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So, Look, it, it's, a, it's a fairly safe bet, you know, the, like the, oh, yeah. those, that, that battalion box is going to sell. You know, to be fair to anybody developing a product, their first and foremost uh, decision has to be, <laughs> will, will this sell? sell? Yeah. Will we get rid of this? Um, yeah. I just, um, I just from a, um, you know, from a from a gamer perspective, and for somebody who who loves the spectacle of it all, it would have been nice to see it breathe a bit of life back into some of those uh, some of those kind of uh, heavy support units and things like that that we just don't oh, see, yeah. Yeah. or to, to 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 encourage people to feel something you know a bit different. Um, but hey, it, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, I'll certainly be digging out all the vindicators and stuff I have anyway. You know, to to, to run out. Yeah. Uh, it, one of the interesting things in this, and I'm looking forward to seeing it, is when when the first edition of Apocalypse came around. Okay. Yes. There was very much a focus on the super heavies. Mm. Um, so the, the that was when we got our first Bane Blade kit. That's coming back for yeah. this. So. so actually, I think 
So if I remember correctly, it was something like that. That was him, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if that's the one from the first edition. That looks like a, no, that's, like that's a, a, a better one. repack yeah. than the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, they had. And then the other thing that they brought out at that point, uh, again, I happen to have one sitting there, was the Stomper. Nice. This Stomper, one of the hardest kits ever to put together in your life. But it didn't matter <laughs> if you put it together because it was, it was meant to look that way anyway. Codenamed the Princess. Yes. Um, was a massive uh, undertaking and workshop at the time. Um, and all of their plastic engineers uh, and stuff were um, uh, were really, really proud of, of getting that kit out. Hmm. The other thing that was in the box, if I remember, or in the book, was it they, they had all the stats for the the big titans yeah, well, the and there was a, a lot of focus on the titans well it was there was there were titans in there jerry that forge World weren't making at yeah. the time so the warlords and stuff like that, all that stuff we were kit bashing back then I footballs for heads i wonder if apocalypse is going to take that shape again and um if there's going to be an emphasis well, on this because i know that the bane blade is is getting a, a, a re-release mm. a fabulous re-release all seven variants in the one box it's impressive i wonder though is it they're, they're in, in all the imagery of mm. stuff that in the end of the artwork that they're doing for apocalypse there's titans yeah. and stompers and all sorts in the background so the, yeah. that, i, I yeah. imagine they'll be looking to forge world for a lot of that, that stuff. to me yeah. will be a, a, amazing because you know forge world has pushed much further on now with the readers oh, yeah. and yeah. the uh, and the warlords and stuff now so seeing seeing those starting to come out of people's display cabinets yeah and, and, and onto, onto, the, onto table. the table i am do you know what i think the internet's just going to explode with some of the coolest photographs <laughs> we've ever we're ever likely to yeah. see imagine people actually being able to put thunderhawk gunships down and then gw can torment everybody by not releasing a plastic thunderhawk yeah i wonder um I was wondering, and then my mind went blank. All oh, right. I as, as my mother said, <laughs> if you can't remember what it was, must it have been must a have lie. Been a lie. Yeah. Um, there was so there was something there was something in there, and it was really important. And then the said, old, we, we all hope flyers won't dominate. Uh, we all hope Eldar get ruffle stomped in the oh, rules. Yeah, we want yeah. we want Eldar to get a good kick in this time mm. round. Um, no, it's gone. It must have been a lie. So uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll never know. No, never it's um, so. The, yeah, yeah, there we have it. Apocalypse is uh, on the way. Yeah, people will be retconning it back to uh, use for epic. Just change inches to centimeters, because as far as far as no, everything's in there anyway. So you'll be able to wreck through. Yeah, it. for doing it. Yeah, well, it's a great way to run a po uh, to run epic games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone someone was um, talking about that in the comments of the the news article, and they were saying, "Oh, it'd be really nice if they actually went back and did epic again." I know there are a lot of people out there who are actually like coming up with ideas to play epic epic we're using the new stuff that came out for adeptus titanicus yeah. kind of thing so and there are companies still out there as well that do sort of versions of models that you would have seen in the past as well so oh, yeah there's still a lot of people out there playing epic in various variations too so epic uh, epic actually sounds like a really interesting way to just take the apocalypse and as you say just to take just everything scale down, it down yeah. scale it down and, and, and work away with it it's handy if you don't have 30 foot of table and <laughs> you know a dozen friends to play with you know you can play an apocalypse game with just two people on a, yeah. a standard six by four so well uh, apocalypse is on the way guys um we will be as i've said i'm gonna i'm gonna look at uh, something quite apocalyptic for the 40k hobby weekend i think that i think that weekend deserves it i think we've got we've got some some ideas that we're we're mulling over at the moment we have just over a month to mm -hmm. execute it we can do it we can totally do it so um yeah stay tuned uh, for that um next up in other updates mm. the flames of war slow grow league yes okay um so we uh, we did the flames of war boot camp we are getting totally into our flames of war late war at the end of this month um justin and ben and the dr dave are going to be at the flames of war open day mm -hmm. in nottingham so if you can get up to that grab yourself a ticket get up and say hi to justin ben and uh, dr dave lick his head for luck that. yes lick justin's <laughs> head every time he loves that mm, can't get enough of it <laughs> there could be prizes 
So what we're doing is, as on tabletop, we want to get stuck into this uh, Flames of War slow grow league as well. So mm -hmm. what is happening is um, um, Battlefront are, are launching a slow grow league. I think it'll be launching around the end of July, I'm told. Okay, and it's going to run from July until um, about mid to late October, because in late October. Um, uh, ourselves in Battlefront are launching a worldwide global campaign. So the campaign system is going to come out a couple of times this year, and this is one of them. And you, you, it's worth getting involved in this slow grow league to build up some forces to we all do a massive world war um, come the end of October. So it kind of works that you're going to be building, um, so your first 50 points or yeah. so, and there'll be painting challenges and and get so then like a mini tournament, and then you can add another 25 points and then another 25 points after that to get to kind of like a 100 point list yeah. by the end of it that, that you can then use in the campaign. There are prizes and there is a hobby league kit there is that, indeed, yeah. that stores and clubs can pick up, yeah. Jerry. There is, um, if you actually have a look at the Flames of War website, they've actually put a little video up uh, already, but then uh, at the bottom you have two email addresses there, which is yeah. Battlefront's uh, customer service. So if you're in Canada or the US, use customer services USA at mm -hmm. battlefront.co.nz. And if you're in the rest of the world, uh, use the customer service ROW at battlefront.co.nz mm -hmm. um, and they can get the information about how you go about getting those packs. But the packs are um, a poster where it has the timeline mm -hmm. uh, with spaces underneath for everybody to fill in their names. And as you go, you do little checkbox type of thing. So when you've completed your first 150 point build, you get a little tick. When you've painted it, you get a little tick. When you've played some game, you get a little tick and so on and so forth. And throughout then the three months that they're running the Hobby League, you build up um, enough to get rewards. And in the pack themselves, they'll have rewards like uh, custom tokens, so mm -hmm. Flames of War tokens, uh, special scenarios and uh, tactics cards, a little um, Flames of War card deck where you put your tactics cards, you put your hobby cards, your army list cards and your tokens all in there. So these things all build in this way. Um, and each pack will do about 10 people. And the idea is to build the community for Flames of War in your area. So obviously with ourselves, having done the book camp, we've got a, a small group here that we yeah. could build on. Likewise, there were people who were joining in and were picking up stuff that weekend or talking about getting into Flames of War. And this is the sort of thing where now if you've got a club or if you've got a store locally that stocks Flames of War, if you go to them and go, well, look, we're interested, get them to put a list of names together, see how many you've got, and then go, right, well, if you order a pack's worth or two pack's worth, because each one does 10 players, you'll know how many roughly you're going to have, and then you can get these things ordered in, and you've got this sort of three-month cycle to get your kit together, get it built, get games in, and at the end of each sort of section, they're going to have different things, so they'll be like um, D-Day, scenarios will be released at the end of the first 50 points yeah. for the first tournament and then some new scenarios at the end of the 75 points when you've, you've done your your two months and then again the the third month um so you've got something coming new to keep people interested because when you're, you're starting a new game it's keeping the the sort of the foot on the gas essentially yeah uh, to make sure that there's the, the engagement in the area with the actual hobby so you've got this little three month thing where you can get together you get little prizes um and then at the end of it, obviously, we're going to be doing the, the global campaign, which yep. means you should have 100 points, possibly more, uh, that you've put together that you can then chuck into that. Yeah. So you'll be able to play with all shiny new armies. Absolutely. Um, uh, and we are also going to get involved in a global way on this uh, Hobby League as well. So well, we've got uh, two things that we're going to be running. One is in our project system you'll be able to create a project and attach that project to the flames of war hobby league 2019 and um we're gonna we're gonna follow these milestones as well and as you guys reach those milestones we're going to be um awarding you with cool achievement badges and things like that onto your profiles um and then secondly in places so we have a section on the on tabletop site called places where we're gradually building up um a, a global map of wargaming stores and clubs and places where you can game and um, we're adding some functionality to that so that if you have a place 
um, already added, you'll be able to go in and say to in your place, we are participating in this event, in this activity. And also, if you're adding a, a new place, you'll be able to say we are participating in this mm. activity so that um, as well as us, you know, getting the hobby side, we'll be able to show all of the visitors to um, on tabletop a map and say, this is where you can get involved and go and get some games. Yes. So um, uh, we'll post below, we'll have the information and we'll be hammering with uh, on you on this. Um, there's uh, some other cool content that's going on out there at the moment. So four of the Flames of War guys are doing like a tale of four gamers uh, kind of a thing. Over four years. They're spending four years on it. I'm already ahead in, in, in four days. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a blast, I've got to say. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk more about it in my hobby time on XLBS um, uh, uh, tomorrow. Not too much, because uh, I will I will bore people to death with this. But it's, it's all right. I'll I've, talk about Rogue's Drift if you start boring them today. I have finished, I have finished my first uh, uh, set of the Flames of War that comes from the Hit the Beach set, the yep. Germans. And I actually, I'm so proud of myself. Because like I don't paint and I don't do anything. I have done this one hundred percent myself. I've painted it and everything, and um, I, I, to me, it's it's like a, a hundred times better than my first ever hmm. go at it, which was the Knack Wolf. And uh, these guys, uh, I'm looking at this army. I have a wee sense of pride, yeah, because uh, it's just that sense of I did that. I know that compared to ninety nine percent. Of what's going on out there in, in hobby land um it's it's quite weak uh, you know i might i don't have the skills but what i lack in skills i make up with for love of the hobby <laughs> and and i i look at these uh, this little army that i've built and i have deep deep love for it and i have a whole bunch of other stuff now that i'm going to add into it and most importantly mm -hmm. i think i've come up with a cool a cool mindset um, for new gamers, and yep. that I'm going to talk about tomorrow. A three-phase approach to uh, uh, to getting games and getting armies on the table that I think um, will take the pressure off newbies because it's um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, and I, I have an idea. It's, it's almost as innovative as as, as contrast paints. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Right. Can't argue that. So Flames of War Slow Grow League, join your local store and join us. They're, they're not mutually exclusive, okay? Yep. So you uh, you know, help build it up in your local area and um, anybody that's getting involved, come across and join it in the projects. We'll be, like I said, we'll be giving out cool achievement badges. There'll be a bunch of XP points that you'll be able to pick up off the back of this. Um, we're, we're just a slow grow um, leagues is something that we want to support more and more at on tabletop because I see them as absolutely invaluable uh, to hobby uh, to yeah. hobby games. Um, so we're we're using this as a means of uh, of really working with you guys to try and uh, nail global slow grow league uh, kind of um, s systems and, and a way of approaching it that we can that we can replicate as a community time and time again. Final update on the topic of, of um, uh, historical war games. We're going to Historicon, baby! Oh, yeah. So Historicon has moved to a new glorious-looking venue um, just outside Philadelphia. I say it's just outside Philadelphia. To an American, it would be just outside yeah, it's, of Philadelphia. It's only, it's only two hours away. <laughs> to someone like me, it's like the other side of the yeah, world, yeah. Or the other side of the country. So um, they, they have a new venue. Um, we are sending Jerry and Justin from the studio and Oriskany. So we have our three, our two big historical hitters and Justin. <laughs> now, you say that, but somebody came up to us at Salute yeah. and uh, he was down from Edinburgh and he introduced himself to Justin going, so you're the big historical fan then on the site? Because I always see you doing all the historical <laughs> stuff. And obviously because he only ever sees whoever's on camera. Yeah. That's the focus that he's seen. Yeah, that Justin's always the one in there for the his history stuff. So I just, I find that's amazing. <laughs> Tell me more about your historical knowledge there. I, I can't, I cannot, I cannot wait. I, I, I seriously, I seriously was this close to to seeing at, a fucking, attempting flight at, at, at attempting the flight. Um, I, I was this close to attempt it. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'd been talking to practitioners <laughs> about, about any kind of substances that I could use mm. that, that might be able to put me flat on my back <laughs> to, but, so as I could be carried onto a flight and, and carried off on the other side. Um, I was I was this close. I, it, it's uh, We're doing historic on this year. Uh, we are unlikely to do Gen Con this year. We wanted to change things up. We've done Gen Con for a few years mm. now. It's time to it's time to explore some of these other conventions. Historicon has a long history, um, uh, and we are very very excited mm. to be going along to this and and getting a getting a view and live blogging with you guys so that we can all join it in. And that's between the tenth and the fourteenth um, of July mm, in Lancaster, in uh, Pennsylvania, in the Marriott Hotel. In the Marriott Hotel, and it does look amazing. It looks like four floors of fun. Oh, I I can't wait to to see the to see the results of it. Right, Super Fantasy Brawl mm. is coming to Kickstarter, and we had the guys from Mythic Games in the studio to tell us a bit about it. Hey everybody, I am joined in the studio by Leo and Az from Mythic Games, and of course we're talking Super Fantasy Brawl. So it's time. Yes, and, and I own Bruce Buffer like a lot of money because I've said it's time, which means I now owe him like five thousand dollars in royalties. Well, if you want, I can I can take on a little of that. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. There we go. That's what we wanted. <laughs> it's, it's brawl time, right? It's yeah. sort of fancy brawl time. Last time oh, we were here, on, that's got to be your tagline. What? It's brawl time. It's brawl time. It's brawl time. <laughs> uh, last time we were here, we talked about Joan of Arc and Wright Busters and Solomon Kane, and we teased a little bit about sort of fancy brawl. Yeah, and we yeah, teased yeah. a little bit about hell. Yeah. But now, if anyone's been keeping track of our social media and everything. It's been happening. We went to Expo. Uh, we've been going to French conventions. We've been demoing uh, Super Fancy Brawl. Mm -hmm. We're planning on bringing this game to retail at the start of next year. Mm -hmm. But the feedback's been fantastic. The playtesting's totally. been great. The conventions have been amazing. People have been chomping at the bit for playtest versions, digital versions. They just want to get their hands on it. So yeah. we've decided we're going to do a Kickstarter for it. Okay. We, we were how, how big a little Kickstarter? It's going to be, I mean, we'll talk. We'll go into all the details of what you're going to okay, see in okay. it. Um, but we're going to launch it on the 25th of June. Okay. So it is a little bit earlier than we originally planned, because mm -hmm. essentially this is going to give people a chance. If you think you're going to like Super Fancy Brawl, mm. this is your way to say, yes, I'm going to get in early. I'm going to get yeah. some nice added extras and yeah, yeah. um, bits and pieces. And then when the retail comes out at the start of next year, we deliver to all of our backers. You can hit the ground running mm -hmm. and, and get into the game. So 25th of June, we're going to launch a, just, just over one week, an eight day Kickstarter. Oh, super short. Yeah, yeah. super short, super, super, super fantasy. Kind of, it's kind of like a super fan thing for the people who look at it and go, do you know what? I can see myself playing this game mm. and we can get that initial community of people who are going to really enjoy the yeah. game. And it's a, it's a small one, so it's, it's, you don't have to, to spend too much. You know, mm -hmm. it's really uh, contained and I think people can really enjoy. Uh, we will come back to uh, why we made this game, but mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really, really a good game. Yeah, we're just to give an idea, I mean, might as well kind of say off the bat that we're just a few days out, obviously, from when the Kickstarter is going to yes. be. Um, we're looking, although a little bit of wiggle room, of course, that at about a sort of $49 uh, okay. pledge, base pledge level. So if you want to get hold of the entire game with not just the six core champions that come in the starter box uh, for your 3v3, if you mm -hmm. want to get an extra six champions on top Ooh. of that as well. So you can basically rock with 12 champions immediately we're looking at around 49 dollars and you'll also nice. get a few added extras on top just for aesthetic like plastic tokens and a little upgrade pieces mm -hmm. that we can add in there to make it just a little bit more nice for you to play on the table. this is something you and me have talked about before is the the tactile feel of some of the components and stuff. we love fondle Having, factor right yeah <laughs> Oh, that just sounds so wrong. <laughs> Fondle fact is the term. I, 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 well, it was Jessica from Battle, not Jessica from Battle Foam, yeah. uh, who once coined that, and I was like, "That is the term like mm. that for for big, chunky, gorgeous pieces like we have in Super Fancy Brawl." It, yeah. it covers it. Well, it, it's something that Warren's been going through a lot recently with some of the miniatures he's been working with. He wants them to have a little more half, a lot more yep. weight. So he did some some custom bases that he could stick two peas into to give them that, <laughs> that nice chunkiness That's whenever it. you're lifting yep. and setting them. So anything that can add to that feel of the game. The, the I mean, people like, whose hearts go back to the Metal Mini days when they want a hefty yeah yeah well if if you remember whenever privateer went to plastic they actually started making metal bases that's right to give you that feel exactly uh for me it's whenever i'm playing board games if i can get metal coins that just feels so much yeah, nicer it's fun so factor. exactly but i mean like for the extra x factor on this because yeah. i'm not saying that yeah what exactly are you going to be adding? So it's going to be something you'll see over the course of the campaign. We're going to have a few little releases that will be popping up during it as well. But we're looking at having some neoprene options, some okay. plastic upgrade options. We're looking at having some statues as well that nice. we can help put in the board so yeah, you yeah, can yeah. really see and battle around them. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be tied to kind of some of the lore and the story of the game. Mm -hmm. So I guess this video is really going to be a what is Super Fancy Brawl? What's the Kickstarter going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll chat a little bit about some of the stuff we've got coming. 
What I want to say just to, to people who follow us, mm -hmm. uh, this is a game that will take five minutes to set up mm -hmm. and that will come off your shelves a lot. Yeah. Like people, when you, when you play this game, and I can tell, every single people who have taught this game to have been into it mm. and uh, they want to play it again and they and and it, it's been it's a game that you will uh, that you can play on top of the other big ones that you have because uh, it it takes five minutes to 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 set up it takes yeah. like five minutes to learn the rules mm -hmm. and it's very simple but yet you have to think a lot yeah, it's, well, it's... look look what's happened here in the office so we've had you guys across yeah. obviously we're filming some games of course and off ours we've been crowbarring games in yeah. where we can <laughs> because we just want to play more yeah. that it's what i always say the That's... measure of a good game is if i can let's play it and after the let's play is done i can go Actually, I just want to go hammer and tongs at yep. this and have a game off camera. Yeah, that's whenever you've that's got a game, yesterday. and this yeah. has it. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. Fantasy Brawl is a game. So let's let's talk about what what the game actually is. So primarily, it's a head to head game. Mm -hmm. So the core game will be one versus one. Yeah, three champions versus three champions, and, yes. and the playtime for that can kind of range between about thirty to forty five minutes once mm -hmm. you've got the rules down. So yeah, you yeah, can yeah. fit it in in a lunch break yeah. or in an evening mm -hmm. between other really? games, no yeah. problem at yeah. all. Um, if you keep up with the Kickstarter, so when the twenty fifth of June comes around, we are looking at adding in a few other little modes as well that mm -hmm. we're going to kind of let the community have a bit of a say on. So possibly some solo stuff possibly mm -hmm. some team based stuff for multiple yeah, yeah. players as well so we want the core of the game to really be head to head mm -hmm. but we want to have a bit of fun with it as well because it is a light hearted game yeah. in principle um, as Leo said it's, it's very simple to pick up you're just rocking three actions on your turn but there's a very high skill ceiling because there's no dice in the game yeah. big selling point a, a, a big unique point of the game is that it's an arena brawler with no dice so yeah. if you're able to find the best strategies the best tactics uh from the cards you have available that will be the player that usually comes away with it yeah that and to begin with with there being 12 champions each one adds six to your deck yeah so if you're really good at learning decks and learning what each character yeah. can do you can really sort of play the meta and know what your opponent is going to yeah. get up to the that, more you play this is, this the better you'll be for sure yeah. and so, yes yeah. you will anticipate the yeah. cards and, but and let's so bring this up oh, this, yeah. so this, this is the this Gorgeous. is the setting right so this this is dogrin looking into the arena waiting to jump out to intervene between a brawl between suzai and gwen here mm -hmm. this this is essentially you are a player playing as a wizard, bringing together your favorite or your most strategic combination of fantastical champions. Yeah. So we're talking dwarves, Targaryen, high elves, trolls, yeah. ogres. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, all sorts of kind of just, just all your typical high fantasy stuff. We've got phoenixes, we've got werewolves, we've got naga. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at all of them in some detail in a second. Yeah. So you're bringing them together and popping them into this arena. Mm -hmm. So what you've got on the table here is essentially a, a hex grid. We have deployment zones on each side for the, mm -hmm. for the two teams. You'll be playing your three champions out against your opponent's three champions and trying to get to five victory points. Mm -hmm. You've got a challenge track up the top of the board as well, which will be giving you victory points. So you'll be trying to knock out your opponents, which gives you a point, or complete challenges to control areas uh, to have certain champions leveled up to get your tra champions into specific positions like onto trap hexes mm -hmm. or into the enemy deployment. And that'll give you points from the challenges too. But both players will be vying over that the whole time, mm -hmm. which means if they get in there before you and they score it, it's gone and you've lost your opportunity to get it. So you're always trying to move towards your own challenges while trying to disrupt the opponent's plan at the same to time. Anticipate it's, it's, all the time. Always mm -hmm. playing, playing ahead. So it's a, a, an arena brawler at its mm -hmm. very core and it's really simple to pick up but very high high skill ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, to give another kind of thought, this is by Bayard Wu, who worked with us in Joan of Arc and just fantastic work. And we really wanted to bring him back in again to say, look, we want something to have a nice action scene. So here we've got Darren in the bottom right, loosing off a volley with Kilgore pouncing in and then Goldar whipping his uh, long chain where he's lost the, the forearm of his arm. And he's got his chain coming out and smashing into Dogrin, who's protecting Suzai and Gwen. And this is just to give you a feel that- and Darren also shooting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The whole thing is that it's meant to be action, it's going to be coordination you will be using your three champions in tandem you'll be grabbing enemy champions and throwing them onto traps lining them up for a shot with your other champion it's a lot of comboing and the players who can really look at their cards and say this is the best thing i can do this turn they're the ones that will kind of come out on top yeah see one of the things i get from this game is sort of the the old school beat em ups you know you pick your team and because you're only adding in six cards to your deck it's super easy to switch out yeah. what your team is you're not overloaded with new rules whenever you trade someone in and out yeah so it's really going to encourage people to try different teams it's probably a good time to talk about that, actually if you want to grab grab suzar and suzar's Suzanne? deck there we'll have a quick a quick chat about suzar so whenever justin's talking about the cars in your deck yeah what, what we basically mean by that is when you pick a champion that champion comes mm -hmm. with a champion card yeah and then six 
action cards. So this is this is Suzar's champion card, saying that he has zero defense and nine health. And on the flip side of that, if he's able to achieve a knockout, he actually will level up. And in this case, his stats does, don't change, but sometimes they can. Mm -hmm. And he'll basically gain an ability that negates and lowers the defense of enemies around him, mm -hmm. which can aid him or his allies. Yeah. So you have that single champion card. And then when you put Suzar into your team, he will bring with him six action cards. And each one of these action cards will be tied to a color that ties to a core of magic, and each one will have unique asymmetrical ability, abilities that are unique for, for Suzai. So the idea is that there's no deck building per se, mm -hmm. it's just if you play with Suzai, you have Suzai six cards, mm -hmm. you pick two more champions, and you get an 18 card deck. And a, exactly. an important thing also to mention, each, uh, each champion has five cards just for him, and one card that can be used for his whole team, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a reaction and defensing team. So you also build uh, your, your, your team on that, because you say, mm -hmm. oh, I want this reaction, uh, this defense card for my for the rest of my team, so I might pick this one, you mm -hmm. see? So this is... Yeah, uh, yeah. This, is, this is something I've been talking to us about, because you guys have also been experimenting with all mm -hmm. the different layouts you can do mm -hmm. for those six cards, and because it's each one's so, so themed to the character, yeah. it works really well. But but it's also the resource management of do I actually feed the resources mm -hmm. in to get these actions yeah. or are there more valuable ones I can use in my hand? Mm -hmm. the, so the game it's worth saying, I think it's the first time we've probably said this, is that it's completely faction free. Mm -hmm. So you can literally take any three champions. So if you're going to back the Kickstarter at uh, the $49 pledge devil, you're looking at having 12 champions mm -hmm. to make a three champion team from. You take any and mash them together completely. You can either do it as a free pick or you can do it as a draft mm -hmm. with your opponent if you want to have a little back and forth about yeah, it. And yeah. um, once you've got those champions, you take each of their six cards into your deck. And that's just fun. You can just mash that together and go and play immediately. Mm -hmm. But if you're into the kind of strategy of it, if you're into the skill um, and the kind of what can I do to really synergize these guys, as Leo said, picking out those reaction cards that really synergize the team or even going a stage deeper and thinking about, okay, Suzai has some strong yellows. Goldar has some strong reds. If I can plan my turn where I've got three actions, one red, one yellow, and one blue. How can I best try and plan my hand so I can have some really impactful turns? And the idea is you're going to go through your deck every three and a half, four turns, basically, because you go through five cards a turn. Uh, even though you have three actions, you will go through all five cards and you only have an 18 card deck. So mm -hmm. by the fourth turn, you're reshuffling back up. Yeah, even so if long you don't, you don't even have any mill in there. Yeah. So you have a lot of chances to say, okay, I'm going to get multiple rounds where I can try and synergize and make these these champions do stuff together. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of pushing and pulling and maneuvering around the battlefield. So those people who really can come up with interesting combos are going to have a lot of fun. There's yeah. a lot of potential playing. I don't even know with 12 champions what the combination total is, but it's into the hundreds and hundreds oh, yeah. easily. You see, I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens with organized play whenever it eventually rolls yeah. around as well, because then you might see two identical teams or near identical teams yep. and by changing just a single character the the complete play think, format yeah, is somebody change. calculated there's over 2000 combinations of wow. champions you can have already with what we have nice. yeah, yeah i think yeah i think it's going to get much much higher because essentially what will happen is at retail mm -hmm. exactly as you said we plan to support this with regular releases so the kickstarter is going to be your way to get in early uh, get a, a really really discounted rate from what it will be at retail mm -hmm. uh, get some added extras on top of that as well but all of the champions all of the gameplay on the kickstarter will be going to retail because we will release everything there. We want this to be a, a, a balanced game that everybody can get into at any stage. Yeah, that's absolutely awesome. Um, now, is that going to include things like the add-ons and the extras that you're going to be unlocking? Are those going to eventually be at retail or is that something no. you have to look at? We're going to give a couple of little treats to Kickstarter back. Yeah. So a couple of people who are willing to support us early to help make this game yeah. happen, to help us launch, to join the community, to come on the Discord, to be in the Facebook, to mm -hmm. play test a little, to feedback on BGG over mm -hmm. the next what's going to be sort of five, six months. Yeah, yeah. Those people, we're going to give something a little extra. So there will yeah. be a couple of Kickstarter okay. exclusive stuff, but none of it will be gameplay oriented. Ah. Everything gameplay oriented will be on the Kickstarter and gotcha. also at retail. We don't want any disbalance between characters mm -hmm. and the idea is if you go to your friendly local game store and you take part in an event you'll be able to get little treats and tokens and stuff as well and, and added extras from competing in but right. you will, you, yeah you will have a good uh not discount but it will be really interesting if yeah. you if you go on kickstarter which is normal because people pay ahead of time so they yeah, will yeah. save money yeah. compared if yeah. to if they wait until it goes to kickstarter yeah. now, so one important really question is with it being run through a kickstarter the rules as we film mm -hmm. right this second yeah. are still in development absolutely will the rules 
at Kickstarter launch be finalized or is that something that will continue to evolve until delivery? No, we, yeah, we, we do plan to continue. And if anyone's followed our, our Kickstarters before, mm -hmm. um, we love to get feedback. We love to engage backers. We love to continue producing videos and content throughout the process after mm -hmm. the Kickstarter. We love to update every single week on, on the mm -hmm. new champions and what's happening. We've done that with every, with Joan of Arc, Solomon Kane and Wrightbusters. We've always done regular updates. So we will do the same for Super Fancy Brawl because mm -hmm. our biggest plan with this game is that it has a long life. Mm -hmm. That for many, many years, you'll be able to go and pick up a champion being just on his own with the cards there mm -hmm. at your local game store and pop them into your team and just enjoy this game yeah. for, for years to come. That's where we really want Super Fancy Brawl to go. Mm -hmm. and, and we've then... already done that because when we, we go to conventions and we've done that a lot, and as as said, uh, the feedback was uh, incredible, mm -hmm. but we, we write down every single mm -hmm. feedback we have. Mm -hmm. And so the, the game developers, uh, you know, will we'll make some little uh, changes uh, over time and it, it gets better and better with every iteration of the game uh, it's become better and well, now we are really close to, to to the final thing because yeah. now i think it's but it's interesting to to to, to get this uh, massive feedback yeah. uh, especially as we might uh, even give uh a print and play, yeah. right? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're looking at doing uh, Tabletopia support. So we have a digital yeah. version where you can get online, you can test it over the next few months but before your backer pledge arrives. Okay. And we're also looking at having a print and play too. So if you are very interested in getting involved in the testing or involved in just playing it at home, you mm -hmm. can do that. And um, we want to make the game as accessible as possible. And um, we've had a lot of great feedback on just the art and the feel of the game. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are actually asking, can we have a standee version? So we've arranged that for a bunch of different content creators so mm -hmm. they can kind of have a test themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and at Expo, we met with about 20 different press reviewers and stuff to get their thoughts on the game okay. um, and generally as i say that's why we've right. decided to go on the 25th of june because it's been so positive yeah, really yeah. really really positive <laughs> um, okay well look let's show a few well, more I, of the champions up. I, oh, have, you got more? I have one more question <laughs> which is probably something a lot of people out there are going to oh, good, so good, yeah. whenever you actually hit retail and mm -hmm. you're you're releasing new characters new heroes mm -hmm. to put into the world Will it be sets of one, two, three, or gotcha. will it just be individuals? Or so, how would you yeah. like to run that? There'll always be a core set for you to mm -hmm. get kind of started in so you can get all the components and everything you need. Mm -hmm. So we'll always have at least one core set available. So you can yeah. go, okay, that's my core set. That gives me enough for two players, mm -hmm. my board and my tokens and everything I need. Yeah. What we're then looking at doing is having individual champions mm -hmm. or even sets of three thematically mm -hmm. or kind of um, yeah. mechanically tied together champions. So that's if you true. want the kind of nature expansion, if you want kind of the, the expansion that specializes in dark fantasy, we will have that kind of thing. Because we have a world of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. fantasy fun to explore and we have so many ideas we've had as ever we're trying to hold ourselves back a little bit <laughs> like a funny a funny thing is with the 12 champions we have we actually have one human and that's uh -huh. darren um, we, we we just kind of let ourselves go and get wild and have fun so we literally go from ogre to troll to high elf to dwarf to mm -hmm. human uh to mole to tagaran to phoenix to gnome to orc to naga to werewolf like <laughs> like when, when do we get the leo bard <laughs> it's only a ultimate matter controller of time. it's only a matter ultimate of time ultimate controller right? on the tabletop that's all i'm gonna say only the matter of time how do you sculpt the hair in this scale though how, like, how, how do you do it? I, I don't know you, you're gonna ha kind of have to go like anime style <laughs> yeah right just, yeah. just yeah, his level upside has just become more awesome like does nothing does nothing in the game it just has become more awesome <laughs> um, so yeah let's have a look at some of the champions yeah. i guess because we're pointing them out here so yeah. i'll rattle through a few of them quickly so this is Dugrin. Mm -hmm. He's our typical frozen dwarf. And and I should actually say as well a little bit about this, that you play as a wizard, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the world of the game, you are a wizard picking your favorite champions, bringing them together to the Super Brawl. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, bra brawls are kind of like the common thing in the world of Fabulous. Yeah. So everyone brawls, everyone brawls all the time. But the idea is that you're a wizard and you've got to the highest level of brawling, which is the Super Brawl, mm -hmm. which means you have access to go back in time and pick any champion you want from their prime. And not everybody gets that. Only the best teams, the best wizards are allowed that access. The Council of Corrections who manage this, they're the people that say, are you good enough to get prime Dugrin? So <laughs> in Super Fancy Brawl, all the champions are in their prime. They're at their mm -hmm. absolute peak. But in the lower leagues that we don't get to see in the tabletop, there could be Dugrin when he was a bit younger, a bit older, a bit, a bit more a bit more broken, you know? So uh, after he lost his left arm and had to just replace <laughs> that, it with a, a, a hammer. So the idea is that all the champions are getting brought here by the wizards, kind of pulled out of their timeline, put here to, to brawl. And if they win, and this is their incentive to fight, they're given their wish. Mm -hmm. So Dugrin's wish is that his mountain range, his homeland where he draws his ice power, that it would endure forever. That's mm -hmm. his dream because as long as Dundurn, uh, Dundurn, I always get the pronunciation this wrong, as long as it survives, mm -hmm. he and his magical powers will survive, he will uh, endure. And it's his dream to protect his people and his mm -hmm. homeland forever. Other champions don't have such a noble uh, <laughs> and, and nice wish, but that is we want to have a little bit of lore and a bit of fun there. And as we go through the, 
the sort of seasons of the game and releases of the game we'll be developing and evolving that and that's why i say things like the statues and things we'll be doing as part of the kickstarter will tie into the world and the, and the whole nature of the magic and the cores of magic the uh, manipulation the creation and destruction the mm -hmm. three colors that you take your turn with yeah a little one thing i want to do before you move on yeah. because we actually have the painted miniature on oh the yeah table. get him yeah. oh absolutely gimme 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 yeah please. this is one of my faves too well, uh, it's it's something you guys have always done really well and continue to do really well in this project yep. is you take the artwork, it's gorgeous, mm -hmm. it's thematic, and then boom, it's <laughs> on the tabletop. And just look at that. You have captured every aspect, the theme, the feel of it, even right down to his little drinking horn here on the side, where it's just like, I've had enough of brawling today. I need a pint. Yeah. We, we, we've thought of uh, how we wanted the minis uh, to be, you know, like the uh, the scale, uh, uh, the the proportions, and uh, and we wanted them to be like, like really something special. So when you play with these minis, uh, you will feel uh, a sense of... Um, it's it's like a factor. Factor. You know yeah, you want to say it. You want I, to say I've it. never saying that on camera. Yeah, you got to say never, it. Never, ever, ever. <laughs> so yeah, it's worth saying. <laughs> if you want to go to the Super Fantasy Brawl Facebook page ahead of the Kickstarter or on the Kickstarter launch itself, we'll have some comparison shots. We already have some over on the Super Fantasy Brawl page. So yeah, I, I, I did see you around the yeah. studio picking stuff off shelves. Yeah, <laughs> there's some next to some 40K stuff. There's some next to some Privateer Press stuff, mm -hmm. uh, War Machine stuff. There's some next to some Shades Barons, some Aristea stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can get an idea for how these are because they are quite chunky. They are a kind yeah. of painter's delight, really, yeah. if you're into painting them. Yeah, they have like nice bases them. also. They yeah. have like some... some are, are really spectacular so, and they will yeah. come with the bases yeah. if yeah. you're also wanting to get some of your your younger family in there they're chunky enough that you're not going to go it's <laughs> delicate that's right yeah i know most of these guys will when because well, these of course are, are resin prototypes right now yeah. and, and everything here is still very much a prototype mm -hmm. um but the plastic versions whenever we're in the, the final yeah. no problem these are these are durable very now, is it going to be gray plastic or colored plastic well we've had a chat a little bit about this you know because um it's three versus three so it's very easy to see whose team is whose and even if i've got a dog and you just happen to have a dog run, it's still not very difficult to see mm. the difference but we're exploring kind of options with colored rings we're exploring the plastic colors mm -hmm. really we want to choose the thing that shows the most detail mm -hmm. um, and we also want it to be attracted to people that aren't interested in painting yeah. they just want to plop it on the table so yeah. gray is kind of a, obviously we prime in gray oh, um, yeah, yeah. i mean here if you want to show off there's there's mario's there oh, yeah, yeah. um you know so we prime in gray because it helps you see kind of all the detail of, of the mini that's on it so we'll probably do some testing we'll, mm -hmm. we'll kind of work out what's best but the, the key thing is that it's faction free we'll not be doing individual colors for champions we're not going to go rainbow we will probably choose just a single color and go yeah. with it like that you see even just as myself if if i was doing this and we we had nothing i would probably just go to one of my friends that do laser cutting get some colored laser cut acrylic and just pop it beside the base to mark my team yeah nice i mean that, that's super cool. simple and yeah and this uh, super simple see super everything uh, this is great <laughs> super uh, yes. super leo <laughs> this, average yeah. justin we we, we want to keep we obviously we want to have an attractive board we mm. want to have it nice and clean and simple but we also want it to be very um nice to look at aesthetically yeah. pleasing so we don't really want to do anything that's going to detract from the gorgeous champions and the gorgeous of course, minis of course. um but yeah we're gonna we're gonna something we'll continue playing yeah, yeah. of course of course um, right, who's next so we've got Gwen. this is our high elf sorceress. She wields the power of destruction magic. She essentially just wipes out armies with the click of a finger. She's, mm -hmm. she's incredibly magical and her wish is that if she does win the brawl that she should learn true magic. The magic ah. that the wizards use. So she wants to become an owner. Exactly. Exactly. She wants to go from player to manager. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She wants to take manipulation, destruction and creation, mold them together, make true magic so she can be even more powerful than she is currently. Yeah, it's something you've captured in this sculpt as well, is just how delicate the actual different races are, because yeah. she's still a really solid miniature, but you can see that that sort of lithe feel yeah. that you get with an elf, which is just gorgeous. And I can't wait to see, um, if you look at her back on, on her cloak, I know this is a little call out to Beast of War and the on tabletop guys, because I know Lloyd loves to talk about when you look at the back of a mini, because that's what you see from oh, your yeah, side yeah. of the table. I really want to see some star pattern, constellation, mm. cloud, mystical mist, as she, you know, pulling because she's called, she's called the Gathering Storm, right mm. so i really want to see someone go wild with that cloak. yeah that's that's i'd be i would keep my eye out on, on social media for that as we as we release well, it's, it's something painters these days do you just look at their work and you cry and just say i'll never be fit to do it but it's yep. beautiful yeah i mean leo has to work with seb in the office all day oh, every day and I'm i don't lucky, know how i'm a lucky man i don't know how you get I, I, done. I, I, I don't know i hate that man's talent <laughs> he's so good so i'm going for a, going for a lunch break where are you going to sit beside seb uh, I'm just going to sit beside him and eat my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here we have Darren. So this is our human huntress of the Eastwood. She is 
our nimble dive in, dive out hunter. She's very good at manipulating traps. She's very agile. And the idea is, I'm sure you're kind of gathering this already from the first three champions, is each one's going to bring six cards that are very unique to them, mm -hmm. really define their play style, and really change up your team. So replacing one of your three champions with Darren, if you take Dugran out and put Darren in, mm -hmm. it's going to completely change the feel. Yeah, uh, I have to admit, she is my favourite so far. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You wavered just today a little now. You did, you were a big Darren fan girl, and then you were kind of like. Ah. Ah, but th this is something I was talking to you about yeah. earlier in the video, though, because it's so simple to trade stuff out. I mean, like I was looking at what she was doing. Then I built a new team around her, and I thought, actually, she doesn't really fit in this team. Yeah. Let's take Wrath and give him a go. Yeah, absolutely. And, th and th that's the fun. Exactly. Yeah. Chop and change. See where it works for mm -hmm. you. Um, and then if you do want to go into the kind of more organised play, you can do that drafting, where you say, okay, I bring a team of five. Yeah. And then you and I will kind of have a little moment to look at each other's teams and ban each other's champions yeah. and then pick a, a refined choice mm -hmm. tailored to fight your enemy yeah. and that that's where it gets that extra level of yeah, insight. Although I will say I want her just to be in because there's so much detail yeah. on it. The, 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 tra the trap is a gorgeous part on her too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well she has something with the traps, right? Yeah, yeah, she yeah. Does. She, yeah, so when she levels up she can move on to them, get an extra bonus to her armor and doesn't trigger them. Yeah, she essentially gains access to kind of four hexes on the board that no other champion can do if she levels up mm -hmm. and she all of a sudden becomes far more difficult to take down because of that defense. And she can yeah. ambush, meaning, of yeah, when she can go oh, but close she to, allows yeah. everybody oh yeah yeah so she gives her friend a bonus yeah. in armor so that's yeah, her taking grab a, a grab her ambush reaction oh, yeah, so yeah. What, what the guys are talking about here is that each champion at the moment currently mm. brings one reaction but that's not something that's a hard and fast rule it's something we'll be playing with as we bring out more champions mm -hmm. and darren's ambush uh, Jen's reaction, sorry, is called Ambush, which is going to give any one of her team plus one defense, which is great. So you're going to help soak up a bit of uh, potential damage from an attack. But after the attack, she then gets to get placed next to the attacker. Exactly. And that's both a, an aggressive thing and a strategic thing. And if you time this well, so you're, you do it maybe on the opponent's last action, all of a sudden, Darren's appeared from nowhere right, beh right beside them. Yeah. And as when you're playing against Darren, you have to always keep in mind is this going to happen? Should yeah. I hold a specific card just in case you do react to that? And you get into this kind of mind game. Every champion has these special features, mm. yeah. this signature, yeah. uh, which yeah. is very interesting. I and love it, her one, yeah. specifically because you can use it to actually quickly nip in and just nab an objective if your Absolutely. opponent's placed right for yeah. it. Yep. Because your objectives always trigger at the beginning of your turn. So getting a movement during your opponent's turn, maybe at the very end, is just like, what? Yep. Um, so Kiko, this is just still the core champions. Oh. This is Goldar, Scourge of the Several Seas. His wish is to be the richest being in all of Fabulosa. Okay, several. Um, yeah, <laughs> he is. Yeah, we he, we don't know quite many. It's a bit of an argument amongst the community of Fabulosa about how many seas he was the Scourge of. <laughs> but he essentially just wants his name to endure forever as mm. the, the worst oh, pirate who ever sealed the seas. One of my favorite sculpt. <laughs> yeah, he, he seals the ship, the Grave Robber, which we're, we're, we're having Baird Woo's working on some art for us for that as well because yeah we really want to embrace this is i should actually say i haven't mentioned it johannes helgeson actually mm -hmm. is our artist for all the champion art mm -hmm. you've seen so far and we both want to kind of have that beautiful colorful vibrant champion mm -hmm. art but also tie into some really uh, thematic card art and, and lore art as well we, we want to encompass everything yeah now i do have a question is there any chance that we might actually see themed boards themed arenas come out because uh, you're talking about his pirate ship. This I would <laughs> love to see just one laid out with a beautiful artwork of Justin, a match on Justin, his... Just, oh. We have to hold ourselves back. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we've talked about lava boards, mountain boards, uh, water boards, like the Mali boards. Let's just say that, you know, maybe after the, the first season, around. the three champions that win, there might be something special for that. I don't know. Oh. Uh, all, all I'm going to say is that we, we, at mm. the moment, we're focusing on the core so everyone can kind of get a feeling yeah. for the arena. But it's a magical world, yeah. right? I, I mm. want to see someone like, say, Mel the Tarantula or something oh. build like a 3d version of this mel yeah. i'm looking at you buddy yeah. i know you're working we're, on your book at the minute we'll but talk, come on we'll look talk. at it um and you know well yeah. just uh, with yes. goldar he has a harpoon and uh, an anchor yeah and in the game you you can feel that he can grab people and yeah, bring them to them, and them he in. can push them and he's yeah. really tanky and he's uh, yeah he's yes, a, I, I have the rear. seen <laughs> him just stand there and go no i'm here not moving yeah <laughs> not moving, mate. and his reaction ties into his feeling which he intimidates his but yeah. he causes uh, his opponents to be feared, which means they have to run away from yeah. him, which is really, it can just usurp your amazing plan that you just had two seconds ago as you run away in fear. Yeah. Uh, Another no, big one. Yeah, this is, this is Kilgore. I mean, yeah, so Kilgore is 
uh, a troll who essentially believes that no one is equal to his might. In fact, his wish is that he finds someone who's worthy of himself. And the only person that could ever be worthy of Kilgore is Kilgore. His <laughs> wish is to fight himself in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> like, and not, not Mortal Kombat. That's maybe not the right term. <laughs> That's going to put the theme shit in my head all day. Um, so yeah, he's very, very, very aggressive. Loves to jump in. He has this massive mechanical claw that he can actually use to lift his allies Ooh. and throw them into the arena. So, so hang on, if, if I have Doug and I can go dwarf bowling? You can literally go dwarf bowling, dude. <laughs> you like, just, just lob him in. It's Whee! great. And it's cool. With the cards so nice because he gets a running start. Yeah, put him in because you, you get a <laughs> so as I said, if you want to see the, the scale shot we will have on the Facebook page of Mythic Games and also cool. on the Super Fancy Brawl Facebook page, you'll be able to see just these next to other minis because they are chunky. They're on 40 millimeter bases here. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of scale we're after. Oh, they're gorgeous. Yeah. They are um, gorgeous. We've got Suzar. We talked a bit about Suzar already. Mm -hmm. He's our swordsman. You know, he, he's very much inspired by um, true belief, by equality, by trying to basically save his people and his countryside. Mm -hmm. And he's been bestowed with these jade blades. And now he yeah. has this name, the Jade Claw, as yeah. he's essentially the defender of his people. And I think, yeah, we go bring it up here. He's oh, gorgeous. This is one of my favorite Seb paints. Like just mm -hmm. I getting would, all the tiger striping on there is beautiful. I'm super curious to see if anyone goes a bit wild with him and, and does like a white Siberian tiger oh, version yes. or does something like oh. that. That's, well, that is his uh, homeland. Yeah. yeah. We're currently, because obviously we want to embrace the, the lore and where these people, where the characters come from, the champions mm -hmm. and the time the champions are picked from. So we're working on, as I say, some of that lore and background for some of the mm -hmm. key champions in the game. Oh, it's just so much fun. <laughs> and again, it's something that if you're a painter, you can't go well this. You can do the Siberian tiger, the classic oh, tiger. That's what I want to see. I mean, like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing no jaguars in the the thing just yet. Not yet. Not <laughs> yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> just yet. honestly, like we, yeah, we, the, the, plenty of ideas. It's worth noting. Uh, I mean, Leo's just sitting there with the pyramid of evil. <laughs> <laughs> he's the, he's the, the spoiler, is Leo. So he is. Because <laughs> um, yeah, we we picked up this game from a teacher in Germany at Essen Spiel last October. The game <laughs> was brought to us. The design of the game was brought to us at a very, very advanced state, at a really good condition, to the point where we've just taken all the art and the champions and and, and added our flair onto that. But really sort of like 80-90% of the core rule set mm -hmm. is still there from the original designer Joachim um, so we're very very lucky to have that so we tweaked a bunch of the characters but we also have a lot of his initial ideas for champions that we haven't yet done um, and we had r different riders we had different kind of um, kind of con conical stuff that we are going to go back and tap into as well because he had a really strong community that we're kind of trying to uh, inspire and, yeah. and stay close to I think the first person who tried the game was uh, Benoit, Benoit yep. and Benoit, you know, who created Mythic Battles, oh, yes. you know, that we worked on uh, mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, he's, it's a game that he designed, so he's very sensitive to these kind of games. Yes. And he fell in love immediately yeah. with this one. And then he said, oh, look, I found I've, I've seen this game and it's it's so cool. The, 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 the fight mechanism are, are great. Uh, mm. uh, there's a bit of randomness because of the, the card you draw, but mm. not too much because you have no dice. So I really like it. It's uh, fast to play it. At, at, and then he said he was so enthusiastic. I, I rarely see him that <laughs> enthusiastic. And so when we tried, every single person in the mm. office loved it, fell in love immediately. Mm. So it was not a game we 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 had developed ourselves that we wanted to do. It's it was so good already. Mm -hmm. And then I must say that uh, the developers uh, who've worked on on, mm. on Josh it, and Stu, yeah. Josh and Stu, have done a, a wonderful job because mm. they kept the initial mechanism, but they refined everything, and it's now really really much better even better than it was and yeah so that was just the story of this game you know sometimes we don't plan on doing something it's just a game that uh, an opportunity that arrives exactly. the game is so good that say, we, we we cannot not do it yeah it's it's a it's one thing i love about the way you guys work though is if you are working on a real set and you're refining it you don't start throwing the kitchen sink at it because yeah. there is nothing in this game that mechanically interferes with what you're doing mm -hmm. as a player it's always player versus player yep. and you have your objectives here because I, mean, I i look at the the objectives deck that's running on the track I mean, like very easily, you could have thrown something like a board wizard card in there, yeah. where they were, you know, maybe moving someone randomly, mm -hmm. screwing your plans up. Yeah. But then the game's interfering with your play. Yes. The game gets out of the way and lets you play tactically, yeah, and that's whenever you're doing your refinement, works really well with you yeah. guys and the talent and your team. Yeah, one hundred percent. And it, we're, we're in a lucky position now, where you know we do have a Joan of Arc team, we have a Solomon Keen team, mm -hmm. we have a Wright Busters team, we have a Super Fancy Brawl team. We have a, a lot of different developers that are focusing on projects. So this this does have a team of two guys who are working mm -hmm. on it nonstop, yeah. plus they get support and regular. And play the, the guys who are there are used to 
uh, like these competitive games and yeah, or yeah, organized yeah. games. Yeah. They have th had some results in, in mm -hmm. these kind of games. They are very yeah, yeah, good yeah. at that. And so they were really focused on what we wanted. And I think the result is here. People, yeah. if you want to try it, well, we, we, we yeah. do. We oh, do. yes, there'll be plenty of Let's Plays yes. to watch, yeah. for sure. Uh, That's something I meant to ask. Uh, so you're looking at doing the print and play. Yep. No, I have actually not heard of Tabletopia before. Yeah. So if you're like me, you don't know what it is, where sure. can you go and get it? So, well, Tabletopia is actually just a website, so uh -huh. tabletopia.com. Uh -huh. And it's basically an in-browser uh, tabletop simulator, essentially. Ah, so, okay. so many people may have heard of Tabletop Simulator, which yes. is a Steam app, which yes. you, you purchase. Um, and then there are different um, add-ons, workshop add-ons that people make and put yes. in there. Tabletopia is kind of like this, but it's in-browser, and they do work directly with publishers. So they yeah. have a whole host of games on there um, where they've actually agreed with the publisher to make it specifically mm -hmm. for the okay, site. I'm going to have to um, look at that. It's completely free to play a lot. So, for example, um, two-player modes of some games will be free, whereas the three and four you might have to have a subscription for. Uh, okay. um, so, for example, I think what we'll do is make sure that anyone that backs it, if they want to get involved in that, we'll try and make it available to everyone that does, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, at least um, reasonably early in, in the kind of uh, pledge manager process so yeah, people yeah, yeah. can spend a few months with it. Yeah, that's very good. Um, I'll rattle through a bunch more stuff, actually, just yeah, quickly. So, I mean, we haven't we haven't focused too much on the gameplay, but this is a slightly older map, which only has the, the two area hexes. So we're, we're kind of, we've, again, we're play testing as it goes on. But this is the kind of arena board we're going for. We're going to look to improve this and kind of work on it a little bit more as well. But it's, it is hex based. It is grid movement, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to always be kind of moving within them. You never share an area. So it's very much that one space of movement that puts you between an enemy and your ally, or that one space of movement that gives you a straight line push into your trap. It's very, as you, you just alluded to, very tactical. So yes. this kind of board gives us that kind of just very simple, very streamlined areas to hold, statues to block movement, and then there'll also be randomized traps as well placed in the board yeah. where you have a little bit of control about where you put them that you can then try and manipulate your enemies Well, you into. can engineer your choke points. That, that's that's it. It's very much about, okay, I know my champions love being in melee, or I know they've got a champion that's kind of got straight line range attacks. How can I manipulate the board? Yeah. So very, very quick and simple in it for anyone to understand. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Well, we could see here Wrath. Yeah. Was, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, on, yes. On this the, guy? Yeah. 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 I yeah, love this. the design of this guy. <laughs> and I mean, like the fact that he looks like he's just bursting out of the ground. You can see his feet don't even touch the base. Yeah. This is Rath our mole, and his whole his whole premise <laughs> is that he is going burrowing underground. Yep. He's getting in close to people. He is very sneaky. He's one of the only champions in the game that has a way to attack someone without allowing their opponent to play a reaction card. Yep. So he has ways of kind of getting through. Um, it, uh, kind of unblockable, kind of unreacting uh, to damage, yeah. which is really uh, a huge skill for him, but he's very fragile. Uh, he is only a little mole. If you want to play whack a mole with Wrath, he only has six health. It's not going to take a lot for you just to boof him and, and take him and out. If so, he levels up, yeah. If he levels up, he gains poison, which means he's going to be able to um, take advantage of champions that don't have yes. very good defense. He's going to be able to get through those who aren't able to defend themselves and yeah. do like, double damage essentially to those champions. Yeah. Like, see, I'm I'm very curious because now my head is just bubbling with different ideas that you could run for champions. Because yep. I mean, like, if you ran, say, a pair of weaker champions. Mm -hmm that were actually a pair of twins that actually added, instead of six mm -hmm. cards, 12 cards. Oh, see? See, but let us run really one Kickstarter it. and launch the game oh, first. No, you will launch it's, the it's game. What I love about these games is <laughs> yeah. they allow you to have so many ideas. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm sure your, your community is just going to be bubbling away with those ideas. Well, we would very much like to do a roughly, roughly about one champion every month. Yeah. We might have little mm. breaks kind of during kind of competitive seasons or during organized play or just kind of at the end of each kind of cycle. But ideally, on we'd like average, to, yeah, yeah. on average, something like one champion a, a month. Yeah. Meaning, yes, every, every year you're going to have lots of new injected mm -hmm. faction free And every gameplay. time you bring a new champion, you add gameplay and you yep. add uh, replayability mm -hmm. and yep. uh, you can change, try new new combination, new teams. And yeah, so yeah. that's interesting. Interesting. And I mean, like, yeah. you also have the opportunity if you were to do like themed ones for holidays, yeah. you know. So, oh, look, it's Christmas, yeah. Dogger and Santa. Yeah, you... <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know I, I'm hurting you. Yeah, you're Leo's, hurting you. Leo's going to sit there and go, This is taking, idea. taking, all, all, the, taking all the good ideas before we even launch the game. Just <laughs> let, let people come and see the game because, with, like, to be honest, what we're offering the case tower is going to be incredible. Yeah. But yes, we want this, as I mentioned, this is going to be a long time product that we'll definitely support. Yeah. Con exclusive, seasonal exclusive, yes. organized play wins. You know, for me personally, I want the person that wins the world championship of Sir Ramsey Brawl to get a wizard hat and staff and a cummerbund with a champion <laughs> belt sort of thing. And I, I want to have a champion done in their vision, all this stuff. We yeah, have yeah. tons of ideas. We just have to uh, keep ourselves on a nice, tight first product and then explore yeah. the world, I think, is where yeah. we'll go. But it, it has such potential. And that's one thing I want to get across to people is there is so much scope yeah. for growth mm -hmm. in this game between yeah. 
organize play events, you know, just start events at your store yep. and just sitting down. If you're sitting for a night and going, oh, you know, I don't want something heavy like Twilight Imperium. Let's break out Super Fantasy Brawl. <laughs> That's it's quite really the a key point. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I know. That's a really important thing. It's a game that you can get out very, yeah. very, very easily, very fast. You, yeah, you, can, you can set get it up and games get, in and you night. can play yeah. and yeah, Easy. you could, yep. you could, you could play three or four games in the afternoon if yeah. you wanted. If uh, you know, yeah. so if, you, if you're training the for that uh, organized and play event, you can just stick also, on Eye of the Tiger and off you go. Also, what I've noticed is uh, the. It's, there's a big variety of people who enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. You have like the uh, uh, fathers competitive and sons, competitive fathers and sons. You have like uh, families. You have uh, competitive players. You have all all these yeah. people seem to to enjoy this game mm -hmm. for different yeah. reasons, maybe, but they the, do. Yeah, this is one of the key bits of feedback we got from UK Games Expo because, as I said, we're, we're running six demo tables and we we're doing it consistently over, over a three day convention, and we literally saw a, a wide array of mm -hmm. people playing the game and really finding their fun with it. Yeah, although I love the fact that everybody has the same ability pool to work with mm -hmm. whenever yeah. they're playing. Because I mean, like, say I was playing a game, uh, I have Suzai, you have Suzai. Mm -hmm. We might play them very differently, Absolutely. even with the same cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Depending on the challenges that come up, and so yeah, yeah. This is something I wanted to talk about in terms of that replayability, mm -hmm. in terms of that variety. Every time you play the challenge deck and the challenge mm. track, how they appear, the order in which they appear, when you score them, whether they're worth one, two, or eventually kind of falling off the discard pile, depending on how many points they're worth. The timing of how you strategize is mm. so important. You're always going to play a turn ahead of yourself because mm -hmm. you'll be checking for these challenges at the start of your turn, which means I've got a position myself mm -hmm. try and put some damage on your champions try and get myself into some scoring positions and yeah. put you in a position where you can't handle everything i kind of put on your plate yeah um, so you're always trying to play ahead and the, as i say the best players you can kind of do a balance a balance of both yeah now is this something that's always going to stay consistent or is this something that's going to be <laughs> stop trying to change the game before we launch sorry, it sorry i'm uh, just considering so is it yeah, at the, at the minute we have one challenge deck which has 11 challenges yeah. in it, but we it used to be 8 and then at one point I think it was like 16 and then yeah. we kind of pulled it down and we refined it. So I think we're sitting with 11 challenges now, um, but this is something that could definitely change. It could definitely change with map, it could definitely change with the event that we're running. Yeah, yeah. It could, yeah. This, this is something that gives us a lot of and it, uh, it design brings, space. I, yeah. I love this because it brings uh, a lot of movement uh, mm. in the game. You know, there's always something happening, there's nothing, it's never static mm. and you can always, you move all the time you, you do things well, you try it informs your tactical flow yeah Absolutely. And you, you know there's only one of each type of challenge in there. So if you've seen multiple come up on one side of the map, you can start to say, OK, probably in the next round or two, yeah, yeah. we're going to see some new challenges come up. So I should start thinking about moving somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a bunch more cards to show. So this was just that like we showed Suzanne's cards earlier. But this yeah. is to give an idea. Whenever you're watching any of our Let's Plays, it's very likely we'll have the prototype cards. But this is the kind of card art that we're going to be working towards. Mm -hmm. So all the cards will be thematic for the Flash of Jade, for the Double Strike, for the Revenge. They're going to all be themed really appropriately. We've got a couple of new artists to bring on board to make sure that all the champions feel really good. It's still... Yeah prototype here yeah, right that means so. uh uh it's not final art uh and it's not the, the final layout as well That's right it. but it's yeah it's still being developed but it gives you an idea every single card will will have their own uh art yeah, yeah. so you see you see Dugrin's love for Dunduran coming through you see uh, the things that make him his hold ground the things that make him really iconic as a character oh wait that's a warhorn yeah right <laughs> <Derp>. <laughs> these are the things that really bring him out and yeah. make him feel really good yeah it's it's nice as well that you don't have a stupid amount of like keywords on there everything sure. is very the same keyword does the same thing yeah. but it's used differently with different characters yeah. which works so good yeah we have we have a, a small number of keywords for movement and mm. then a small number of keywords that relate usually to um attacking or kind of the reactions to attacking so yeah. a lot of it is, is pushing and pulling and dashing and dodging these kind of things like that um, and then a lot of the other ones are things like how much increased damage or how much yeah, of, how many times you can yeah. hit and keep it like really clean. It is exactly right. Yeah. It, the, you don't have to remember too many keywords. Yeah. It's mm. very simple. The, exactly. You really read the the rule book and you can play. It's mm. it's very very easy easy yeah. uh, to, yeah. to this, learn. This is what I find with the playthroughs that we've done. It's very easy. You hear bloodied. I instantly know. Okay, that's going to half health. Yeah. yeah. You know, I hear double. Okay, I'm doing this attack twice. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's easy, very easy. straightforward.
Um, yeah, I'll bring up a few more like examples. This is quite a couple of team examples. We have Suzo, Kilgore, well, they, and Darren. Yeah, you can just, see the size and uh, the uh, of the of the minis and the uh, yeah, quite, the skill. Quite a lot of variety yeah. that we're going for, and even with characters that are more slender or are smaller characters, we're trying to give them really dynamic poses. Mm -hmm. All these bases will come exactly as you see them there. So we will have kind of the rough sand, we will have the grass, we will have the bursting from the ground with wrath. They'll all come with that unique feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and talking about wrath, here we go. There's oh, the yeah. man himself. <laughs> <laughs> the stalker beneath. He's actually uh, Kilgore's trained uh, assassin, uh, Rath. <laughs> um, so Kilgore and, and Rath actually are kind of from the same timeline and they're actually kind of synergized together a little bit mm. in that if you think about Kilgore throwing Wrath in, he gets thrown up, deals a bunch of damage, and then burrows away. Ah. This is the idea. That they kind of, um, they really, when you play those two together, you'll feel them going, oh, actually, these these cards, these actions they have, really mm -hmm. do just feel right. Yeah. And you can see a very slight similarity to the armor style between the two of them, so you yes. can sort of get that sense that they are linked. Yeah. I, I mean, like of course, it. we want to see people go wild with the people oh, yeah, jobs, yeah. you know. But yes, they, they, especially the, the gauntlet um, of Kilgore yeah, and the then segmented the segmented armor. Yeah, and then the, the, the gloves, the gauntlets that uh, um, Wrath yeah. has. Yeah, they have that synergy. Yeah. That and one other thing I love is all of the the attack cards and ability cards have a little quote on them from mm. the character. So again, it's yeah. just those little bits of narrative that you can just go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and that, we want to keep that in there yeah, for sure. That, that, that's key to, to the game. Um, we've got Marius, who's a brand new champion we've actually done a couple of Let's Plays with now, so you can see he is our werewolf. He's essentially very, very agile. He actually likes being bloodied. He actually likes taking damage so he can then lifesteal and soak that back mm -hmm. up. And he gains effects by having people he's targeted be bloody, be on half health or mm -hmm. lens. He's, he's hunting, he's smelling out the blood, and he'll, his attacks are okay, but if he's targeted, targeting the right champions at the right time, he can be very, very mm -hmm. strong. So he's sort of a situational, highly mobile, get in your face and tear to shreds kind of champion. And I, I must admit, I am in love with, <laughs> with his the sculpt. Mini. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it's gorgeous. Look at this. Um, so for, yeah, for me, he's a very versatile character, but if you do take him, you have to be prepared to support him. If your opponent kind of focuses him down, you could see him go, because he's got no defense at all. You could see uh, him kind of get a a bit of a weak point in your team. So he's, he's that kind of risk reward, mm -hmm. is Marius. How many hit points this is? Seven. Seven. Uh, yeah. And with so zero defense. Bit of a beating. Yeah. Um, we've then got Korvash, the wielder of Scorn Blade, whose sculpt just makes me so happy. Because the idea is that Korvash is the orc, but the blade itself has a demon inside it called Scorn. And Korvash has willingly given himself and control of his, his body, essentially, and his mind to Scorn. And Scorn is controlling Korvash, trying to get him to essentially wipe out the world. Oh. The idea is that Korvash wants to be stronger than anyone else, and he gave himself to the Blade, thinking Scorn mm -hmm. would enable him to do this. So he is this full-bloodied charge in, get in the middle of melee. He actually has a couple of cards that will hit Alan allies and even if they hit allies he will get stronger oh. so he has some attacks which start with zero strength but for every champion around him it will increase by two mm -hmm. so <laughs> if he's near enemies it'll go up but if he's near allies his strength will get higher but he will hit his his allies as well what as is yeah, the as highest strength attack you it, could so have? he could get up to strength 10 <laughs> if you literally got all three enemies and all of your two other allies together so basically whirlwind of death everything's dead Korvash <laughs> if he is in the middle of like right in the middle of the brawl he is mm. terrifying but throws himself in there. Yeah, like he, I'm, I'm just wondering, are there any cards that would let me teleport him into the middle of something? Yeah, yo. <laughs> He, yeah, you're now you're thinking with portals, well, yeah. right? Now, now. You could throw him with uh, Kilgore. Kilgore, Kilgore yeah. yeah. Just have Kilgore chuck him. Mm -hmm. Oh, that could be so dead bad. <laughs> so dead good if you're playing as it though. Um, so then we've got Kolel, oh, and the, yeah. just to show like the, the difference we have. So this is yeah. our gnome Camellia Raptor rider. She's our, our scout. She's highly nimble, and of course because she's riding the Camellia Raptor, she's a lot of cars that let her jump and pounce around mm. the field. She actually has a Love double jump. Cult. Yeah, oh. she can pounce three hexes, attack, and then pounce another three, or she can mighty leap into an area, knocking people back from wherever she lands. Yeah. But she's also got these blue dart poison kind of range attacks yeah. too so she mixes attacks of Kolel herself yeah. and it's her own kill core yeah <laughs> poison is brutal against people without defense yeah. and then the community raptor is just great at getting in there and knocking people away mm -hmm. and getting close so she actually has a lovely mix of mobility and then jumping in and out yeah. which is really nice yeah um yeah. we've got Akhet 
Um, he is our light of creation. He's our Phoenix champion who brings a couple of really unique things to the table. Aket, first of all, can fly, so he has the swoop ability, which lets him swoop in a straight line. And he has a card which will let him pick up the first champion he swoops into and then drop them wherever he lands, which mm. can be used to rescue allies, to maneuver around the arena, ah. or even to grab enemy champions and chuck them onto traps or chuck them into weak points where you can then... I points see. on them. This might be something I may have been doing wrong yeah. in some of the games we've played okay. then because so the swoop card that lets you pick someone up, mm -hmm. I thought that was just a part of swoop. So is swoop just a move? So or swoop, does it yeah, let you right. do the or yeah. does it let you do the pickup yeah, as well? Swoop is just a, a type of movement. So we've got dash and we've got swoop. Okay. So I may have done some stuff wrong here. <laughs> I apologize now. It's fine. It's all it's, again, it's all part of the learning and the prototyping, mm -hmm. really. Um he, the other thing he does, because he's a phoenix, yeah. his reaction is very much based mm -hmm. on that reincarnation. Yes. So if you happen to have one of your champions yeah, taken out of that's... action, he could instantly bring them back. Yeah. Now it's worth saying we haven't talked about it in the rules, but if you do lose, if one of your champions get knocked out of action, they simply go back to your deployment, they go mm -hmm. back to your your kind of starting area and then can immediately walk back onto the arena so they'll, they'll essentially if you have a champion taken out they'll go back to your your corner but can immediately use movement once it gets back to your turn again to move back into your mm -hmm. deployment so they could even sort of reposition on the board quite yeah. easily you will lose a victory point to your opponent i mean your opponent yeah. gains one for knocking out but you're straight back in mm -hmm. there's no elimination of your champions because the idea yeah. is you're a wizard you're going poof no pull them out before they actually take severe damage yeah. bring them back and send them in again yeah it's one thing i like about a cat though which is if you're holding an objective and someone gets knocked out and you're about to get you, some good or i'm bring about them out to of the score fire. Yeah. i can just go no 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 yeah. do that again yeah and yeah. Aket has them rise out of the ashes and yeah. basically be reborn. And yeah. w when you come back, you come back with your full uh, hit yep. points. So that means it's not uh, the more you lose, the more you lose. You know, yep. you always, yeah, no you can always, returns. yeah, you can always exactly. come back. You know, mm. I've seen some games where uh, one was leading four to one, I think, mm. or four to zero, and it ended up five to four. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah, you know, yep. and I, I have seen games where you yourself has. Mm -hmm. I think you were playing against Coco in the studio yep. last night he had knocked out two of your heroes yep. you only had one on the board and all of a sudden you just charged the other two back yep. on and swung the game yeah there's a there's a real strategy to picking out when you actually decide to make that knockout blow there's, mm. there's a real thought about should i take them out now knowing that actually they will be kind of kind of coming back in or should i hold that for a second focus on the challenges and the objectives for a moment and mm -hmm. then try and finish that off and you yeah. will have to make those decisions regularly um we've got Solka. oh yeah who yeah she's our final champion we're showing today uh but during the kickstarter if you do kind of follow us along from the 25th of june we'll have some interesting stuff to show and Solka's the poisoned mind she basically ruled her dynasty for over a hundred years before she perished and her wish is that she would become immortal and that her civilization would never learn of the fact that it was her nefarious means her pulling the puppet strings her basically being a bit uh, untoward and a bit, a bit yeah. dark it was those things that she did that helped her rule and helped her civilization survive but she never wants her civilization to find out and mm. um, she is an incredible support character she really very much is focused on maneuvering the enemy actually forcing your opponent to lose cards from their deck mm -hmm. even um, and actually kind of she uses force really well pushing is always away pulling is always towards and forcing is forcing them in any direction you want mm -hmm. so she's got a great way of kind of saying no you need to just get right off that objective or you need to get right out of the way yeah, so I or can get here in. you're oblique to that trap get on there absolutely like so she is actually um just very very good at manipulating and she can even life steal hit points from the enemy and give them to her allies oh. yeah she she's really playing Freaky this kind of me. yeah this kind of creepy naga uh kind of i uh, love the Asian art style. Yeah. the sculpt i think it's it's very it's very exotic and very uh it's a good word yeah so yeah this it's essentially what sort of fancy brawl is. So it's an arena brawler, primarily for two players, but it will have kind of other head-to-head -head modes as we develop the game as well. We are also looking at some solo fun stuff, but the real focus is the head-to-head -head gameplay. We're going to launch on the 25th of June. $49 is where we're aiming for the, the initial pledge level to be all, all being well, and that will get you essentially to the 12 champions that we've mm -hmm. kind of walked through there um, with a few added, added extras aesthetically for, for the Even the if it's only eight days, we will make you know this campaign exciting. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will be... We will be doing lots of things during uh, during the Kickstarter. Yep. Kickstarter. We'll have some surprises, so you have to 
to yeah. be there. Yeah. yeah, the best place yeah. to follow us really is on the Mythic Games Facebook page or the Super Fancy Brawl Facebook page. Because yeah. what we really want to do is embrace the kind of free team building, and embrace the drafting, embrace the mm -hmm. kind of competition play, and have like, little tournaments inside the offices, which we already kind of do at lunch times anyway, yeah. um, and just kind of bring that on camera and get people involved and help people see just how versatile everything is. So if you want to come along and watch along in the evenings, you can maybe help pick us, pick a team with us, yeah, yeah. join in and, and have a game with us at the same time. Um, and then throughout the campaign, we will have a couple of little new things revealed too. And um, for those people that really think, mm. yes, I'm going to go off a whole hog on this, yeah. we will have some uh, pledges for that. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, I tell you what, get your comments in below. Are you excited for Super Fantasy mm -hmm. Brawl? Are you going to be jumping in with the guys on the Kickstarter? Myself, Leo, and as I move on, we'll see you again soon. Right, so keep your eyes peeled um, uh, for Super Fantasy Brawl. I, I actually got a chance to to play um, uh, yeah. oh, man. myself. Yes, uh, I think I think we're looking at an organised play winner. Yeah, right there. You see, um, the, the, sorry, I was going to say the thing that came up to me when I've watched all the videos for this one so far is that it feels to me like it's going to have that same like same initial appeal as Keyforge has had in like the card gaming world where it's going to be yeah. really easy to get into it really yeah. easy to play yeah so. it's um yeah. it's a very very well executed game um the the fact that you pick the mechanics up of it so quickly yeah like Keyforge yeah means that, that you have that low barrier to entry but there are so many tactical decisions hmm. yeah and the fact that it's contained you know it doesn't it, it, you know uh, and it and it's centered around these heroes and stuff like that i think it's i think it's exactly the game that mythic needed uh, for this you know yeah. because mythic well, obviously mythic were involved with monolith yeah. way back in the day doing the mythic battles i saw mythic battles as as uh, one of the the most high potential organized play games um, uh, yeah. for miniatures yeah, with, the, with the draft thought, and that sort of thing yeah. I thought Mythic Battles had the potential to, to take uh, to take organized play by storm for whatever reason um, uh, that hasn't happened I think it's because um, it's, it's, there's so much it's so vast and sprawling well I, I, that and the fact that I, I, I just um, it, for, it to, for it to do that it, it had to go into retail yeah. And mo that's not monolith strategy. Yeah. So you know, uh, uh, so uh, mythic battles is uh, is going to be a non-starter. So looking at the talent within mythic and stuff like that, I've always had my eye on them. To uh, from the perspective of, can they repeat this? Can yeah. they come out with another game that has that organized play potential? That thing where communities start popping up all over the world, getting together. Um, for their th Thursday night fantasy yeah, yeah, yeah. brawls, yeah. you know, and uh, I think, I think, certainly um, from a gameplay perspective, I think they have nailed uh, nailed it with this mm. one. I think, it, I think this has the potential to do that. Um, we, we'll wait and see yeah. how how it all goes, but yeah, yeah, I, I would like, I would like to see this um, take the organized play area by yeah. storm because I, I think it i think it has such potential for some really really cool yeah. um op stuff and well, i want to well, see table sorry ben i want to see tabletop right. gaming op yeah. become as big as esports yeah. you know it's um i i, I want to see this uh, i want to see this happen you know it's like we can see in the esports world how this is uh, this is working now to be fair we don't have the same um explosions and booms and bangs and stuff that they have in esports so yes to anybody outside the hobby, it's going to be a bit like watching a chess tournament. Get a couple of sparklers. <laughs> <laughs> but to those of us that are that are interested in this, like I remember, uh, I remember the chess world championships. Oh, whenever I was a kid, mm -hmm. Gary Kasparov uh, was playing at the time, and um, you know, the it was the first time that the chess world championships. I say the first time. It maybe happened back in the sixties when it was Fisher, Bobby or, Fisher, Bobby Fisher, and all were playing. They maybe televised it, but as far as I'm aware, this was like the first time that they got proper BBC coverage mm. of the of this this World Championships. And I remember sitting with my dad, watching this and being utterly fascinated. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, if we if we get the right um, OP systems in place. You know, I, I can see some potential for kind of like an esportsy kind of arena kind of things 
starting to build up off the back of it. It will take years. There's no doubt about that. But we need the right intellectual properties in place first. Yeah. Um, uh, for the likes of that to to happen, and it, so we'll we'll wait and see. Mm. Um, news, Ben. Yeah. What's happening in the world, man? Cool. Uh, so the first bit that I wanted to kick off with is something that's very quick, but it's something that you need to see if you like space marines and you like action and you like digital mediums, right? So there's a film project called Astartes, which uh, is on YouTube and is running through a Patreon. And it's run by a guy who works part time on this, uh, as well as doing freelance work for other digital um, companies and that kind of thing. And it's effectively, at the moment, four parts of a sort of collaborative story that's telling the, um, the this tale of these space marines that are chasing down heretics, smashing it, smashing, smashing into their ship. <laughs> I'm sure Connery Sean Connery. Say. Yeah, and uh, taking on the psychers inside of it. And it is honestly one of the coolest and most realistic, I'm going to say, portrayals of space marines that I have seen in the digital format for a very, very long time. Space Marine, the video game, did it really well. Don't need cover. Just go in there, stop killing everybody because you're a walking tank, effectively. Yeah. This has got down the level of brutality and just ruthless efficiency that Space Marines have, as well as that sort of like dogged loyalty as well. Um, so if you want to see how Space Marines really fight, that is an amazing series of videos to go and watch. Um, sort of... Um, I think it's episode three and four. They're all like only about two minutes long each. But episodes three and four are really when it gets sort of like into the gritty stuff of it all. Yeah. And it is very, 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 very cool. Fantastic. So, yeah. Definitely. I'm, I'm going to be checking yeah. that out. Um, Core Space Purge, the Outbreak yeah. expansion. That's now available, Ben, yeah? Yeah. So uh, uh, Purge Outbreak was a expansion that was available through the Kickstarter when it was originally up from the guys of Battle Systems. But now Purge Out Outbreak is now available to everybody else in the retail space over on their web store. Uh, it adds in two new styles of Purge robots. So you've got the Gatherers and the Annihilators, as well as a new scenario that focuses around them. And you've also got some of the new terrain options as well. So, you know, the terrain that uh, Battle Systems do, which is all that sort of like plug together stuff that makes really, really nice uh, uh, paper terrain. They've got uh, some some new train options in there as well to try and create interesting new, new environments. You'll also find in the box a whole bunch of event cards which will mean that you can take those robots from that specific encounter and put them into your normal games as well. So if you want to have your crews going up against the uh, the gatherers and the annihilators in different scenarios, you've got some really cool options there too. Um, but yeah, continues to sort of add to that amazing characterful world that they've built for Core Space, which is really cool. So. Nice. And Modifius have some new Star Trek stuff. Yeah, so uh, Modifius have been on a roll, it seems, at the moment, with a lot of releases for a whole bunch of different things. But one of the big things that popped up this week was their two new sets. Well, one of them is a collection of sort of older models, and another one of them is slightly more new. And the, the first one of these is their iconic villains set, which contains a whole bunch of villains from not just the TV shows, but also the movies as well. Um, so you've got Sorry, Ben. I couldn't resist. <laughs> so you've got Carl. <laughs> you've also got the Borg Queen. You've got Q, who should be basically in everybody's scenarios in everybody's games. Because even if you're playing a fantasy game, Q should be in there somewhere, right? Yeah. You've got Locotus... Locot... Locustus of Borg, which was the version of Jean-Luc Picard. You've got Gul... Ducat, you've got Law, which was the uh, which is Data's brother, and then you've got General Kang, and you've also got the Gorn Captain from that iconic <laughs> fight. <laughs> and as someone said on Facebook, it's really great to have all these really iconic characters, and then the Gorn Captain. He's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the most iconic character. You can't get more iconic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as well as that. Um, you should definitely go and check out that news story, by the way, because it'll be linked down below in the description because we've got that little fight in the video. So if you've oh, never fantastic. seen that fight, go and watch it. It's oh, very yes. good. Yeah. But uh, as well as that, there's also an original series away team box, which comes with <gasps> uh, an Andorian, a Deb Nolan, <gasps> a Tellarite, a Vulcan, and a human, both male and female of all of these different oh, species. Oh, I love this. That you can use in your away teams when you're playing games of either Star Trek Adventures, which is their role-playing game, or if you want to play their skirmish game, which is called Red Alert, uh, you yeah. can also pick that up as well, which is really cool. So, yeah, some really cool stuff there for people who like their Star Trek. Yeah, pimp more of them as red shirts. Yes. <laughs> I, I pimp them all. Pin, yeah, exactly. <laughs> None of them are making... Well, maybe the Andorans might make it out of their life, but yeah, the rest of them are do. dead as dead as kind of spam. So. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that. Uh, what's next, Ben? 
Uh, so next up, we've got uh, the guys at Osprey Games. Now, uh, they have been doing a lot of stuff uh, over the last couple of years in terms of war games and stuff like that. But they're also now branching out to creating their own range of role-playing games as well. And so in November of this year, they're going to be bringing two to the uh, tabletops of many people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first of these is called Romance of the Perilous Land, a role-playing game of British folklore. Um, this is a one which sort of has you playing as valiant heroes within the world of Arthurian myth and legend. So you're going to be wandering around Britain, you know, going going on quests, going to find holy grails and that kind of thing, and sort of generally being goody two-shoes, as it were. The second of these is called... That'll sell two copies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the amount of people that just run into dungeons and kill everything, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, as well as that, we've also got one called Paleo Mythic, uh, and this is a role-playing game of stone and sorcery where you are playing as Stone Age... Bronze Age tribesmen in a world that's very, very different from ours. A little bit like the Lost World, that kind of thing, back in that sort of period in time when dinosaurs and saber tooths and all that kind of thing were roaming around, where you're trying to go out and adventure and explore the world, survive in the wilderness, take on massive, mighty beasts and all kind of things like that. Uh, both of these games were originally available just as PDFs, uh, but now they're going to be brought into print this November by Osprey Games, everyone to get to, uh, stuck into. And this is just the start. There's going to be a whole bunch more role-playing games that uh, Osprey are going to be working on over the next couple of years, but uh, this one to just, uh, start you off with one that's very high fantasy and one that's a little bit different as well. So, I, yeah. I, I, I've got to say of the two, the Paleolithic one really appeals. It to sounds me. really cool, this. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. Because um, you've got that whole um, Robert Jordan hy- uh, hyperborea. The, mm-hmm. the whole Conan thing is, is this you yeah. know, weird sword and sorcery sort of mm. not, you know, it's non-historic you, mm-hmm. you can do that sort of weird giant snakes, giant beasts, all of that. Yeah, that uh, the, the, that is interesting. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, final piece of news was a, an interesting one. It's made it into the Nottingham Times. Ooh, lovely nice. lovely picture of John Stallard in the, in the Nottingham Times. And this is Warlord Games and Mythicos have teamed up to create a Warlord Mythicos um, store Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to be opening in New York mm. uh, pretty soon. Ben, well, do we know much more about it than that? Uh, yeah, so uh, Mythical Studios are a team over in America that have one venue currently, which is very much geared towards the idea of creating really intriguing and interesting spaces for people to not only just buy games, but also play games as well. Yeah. And so they've teamed up as the US arm with Warlord, who are over here in, obviously in Europe, to create a whole bunch of stores that will be hopefully the same, give the same kind of feeling. So you'll be able to buy loads of miniatures in there. You'll also be able to play loads of games. They'll be set up for tournaments and all kinds of things like that. The new store is going to be set up in New York. Um, so you'll be able to go and check that out, which sounds pretty cool. I don't know exactly when it's going to be hitting, but it should be later this year, which sounds pretty good. But they also have some pretty grand plans to be taking this beyond just New York. They're hopefully going to have them all over the uh, the East Coast, which sounds pretty cool. As well as there's also going to be some stores over here in, in Europe as well, which sounds pretty good too. Um, any opportunity to have some more places to go and play games is always good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this goes. It's a very big endeavor, but you know, you've got you know, a company like Warlord and uh, Mythicos have proved themselves as well. It'll be very interesting to see where it goes. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. Um, next up, Sam got a chance to sit down with the team at River Horse, so Alessio, Jack, and Chris. And they're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's coming up for Pacific Rim and a really, really nice product that they have coming up, which is the Labyrinth Adventure mm-hmm. Game. Uh, RPG, um, which is a nice simple take on the RPG format um, uh, uh, for Labyrinth. So definitely, let's check that out. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Sam from On Tabletop and we're joined this time from his evil lair at River Horse Games. Alessio, how you doing? Oh, good lord. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. <clears throat> yes, that was Employee of the Month. <laughs> um, yeah. How well, are you? I'm doing well. Yourself, mate. All right. All right. Yeah. Busy. Yeah. I. I, I can imagine you're just back from UK Games Expo and everything. Lots of exciting stuff happening with River Horse at the moment. Yes. 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 Uh, feels like too much. Yes. So much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. Let's begin. <laughs> well, we of course ask you to come and talk with us because. Some of those are particularly exciting, especially if you're a fan of retro fantasy like I am. But before we get into that, can you just tell us what are you guys working on? What are some of the things you've got coming up? 
Well, the, the two things we announced at uh, UK Game Expo, uh, the two new things that are coming, I mean, one thing is actually out is the is the Fires expansion for, for Labyrinth. That's literally just arrived. Mm. Uh, but there's two more projects that actually we did announce and kind of uh, discuss with you guys, and we did videos with you guys of uh, playing through them and, uh, and promoting them. Uh, so it seems very relevant to talk to your audience as well about these. Uh, one of them is here, which is the quite big box wow. of OTJ. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, that Cats. is much bigger than I expected when well, I, I saw pictures of the game. The actual, the actual uh, proper box. Uh, this is the latest prototype. The the, the actual production box is twenty centimeter. Uh, sorry, millimeters. Twenty millimeters uh, thinner. So it would be a little thinner than first compared to this. But the the, the actual width and length is so is this size, but a bit thinner on the side. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's. Uh, if I can show you, I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to send you some pictures anyway. But yeah, please. It is uh, quite full of uh, a lot of uh, miniatures. <laughs> well, you know uh, us, mate. We, we are addicted to the miniatures. Anything with lots of miniatures, we like to see more of. Yes, I know for you guys, miniatures are definitely part of the world. But yes, that tray has bags of Alliance, sorry, Rebe Re Rebel, a Resistance, what's your say, and bags of uh, Peacekeeper. So. And of course, then all the nice and juicy heroes. Excellent. Which uh, I'm sure we can share some uh, close ups of those miniatures. But yeah, there's uh, quite an amount of uh, police soldiers in there. And uh, not to mention, well, counters, yes, counters, and, <laughs> and a board, which is <laughs> fairly, fairly huge. And I will disappear now. Whoa, yeah. It just keeps going. And <laughs> Panem, yes, upside down Panem even. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes, it is very massive. Yeah. It has a large box. How are things progressing with the game? You said that that's the prototype. Are there not? Is there much uh, left to do before its final run? It seems that it's going up on the. It's going on the boat. What is it? June, beginning of June? Yeah, this month. It's going on the boat. So, I mean, it seems surreal to say, but this Kickstarter may be <gasps> early. <gasps> Certainly, certainly on time. I mean, things will happen. Of course, it's going to be delayed, uh, but still, delay from now means still on time, which is uh, or early, Excellent. which is cool. Uh, let me just, <laughs> now, uh, now, now we now. hit the struggle of getting it all back in the box. Yes, I think I shall uh, dispose of the box without making any further big noise, loud noises. Mm. And so that was one thing which is uh, coming out and. Uh, if of you, if you are miniature games fans, you may even prefer this even more, I guess. Yeah. Now this, I'll admit, is one I'm very excited for. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of this game, Pacific Rim Extinction. Yes. This is the box, and again, is the latest prototype, but uh, it does show some of the range that is coming. Uh, and the obviously they'll include two miniatures. I hope they don't fall off and die horribly <laughs> and break up. But then the specific system specific dice, and then a ton of punch boards and rules. Yeah. So that's the the rule book. I, I I was just thinking uh, it's it's ironic that you're worried about dropping kaiju and giant mechs. It's like yeah, they can stomp through cities no trouble, but oh, don't want to drop them. They may not survive a a, a drop here, of course. But yeah, in terms of uh, we have some other examples. Oh, we a little beautiful. French strike on here. Uh, there's the there's a Kickstarter exclusive miniature this is only for people that have backed and will be available also i suppose in competitions and stuff but it basically is a promotional miniature of gypsy avenger with the blades instead of the gun and uh, there's a, a first wave of uh, expansions so this is obsidian fury so there's two kaiju expansions yeah. so we have the hakuja expansion Rawr. And the Obsidian Fury expansion. Yes, he is a kaiju. Yes. It may look like a, like a Jaeger, but it's not. And then the good guys also get 
Fantastic. The old Gypsy Danger from Pacific Ring 1 and Saber Athena from Pacific Ring 2, which is probably my favorite mech. I'll, I'll admit, I prefer Gypsy Danger is the one I'd be going for. I absolutely love those movies. Uh, you Now, both of these are prototypes. I, I'm interested. How do you get from this stage on to the next stage? How What are the steps in development there from getting a prototype to the finished product? Well, these are uh, very advanced uh, prototypes. I mean, I probably, I, I think probably prototype is not the right word. In this case, I would call them production samples. Uh, basically, they are this close from the finished product. They basically are the very same contents. The, some of the patch was not punched yet, etc. When they sent us this uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago. Uh, and uh, so it means that um, pretty much you get to see the whole thing as it's supposed to be, minus a few details which are still being worked on. And as you know, the, the original ones, the very old ones, looked quite a lot different. In fact, if you bear with me a second. Oh no. No, he's gone. We've lost him. <laughs> I'll be back. Someone get him. I'll be back. Caesar, are you there? <laughs> oh, so I, that, was, that was very, very scary for me. I've never had to interview an empty chair before. <laughs> so you see, they start like this, and then yeah. you glue bits on it, like this bit here. So that, then you start to, you know, get a bit closer to the final thing by literally sticking blue tack and uh, and printed paper on top of them, and then you look at the contents and you start to measure weigh things and and realize that your lid is heavier is, sorry is longer and bigger than your, your the top of the lid and so all of this kind of stuff and you get several iterations of more and more advanced boxes until effectively this which is literally the last thing you get before they get all packaged and uh, put into into cartons and chipped excellent i always like seeing these different stages of a, a game's development as you get a a good idea of uh, the thinking that goes into it and what what the considerations everyone puts into it. It certainly was an interesting process and uh, we learned a lot because obviously this is our first pre-painted, uh, I, mean, I suppose other than the other than the deluxe pieces, but obviously that's one color and some ink, while this is actually several, you know, like several le levels of painting higher. So it was interesting. It was a very learning, good learning experience. Like uh, just towards the, towards the end of the project, we realized that uh, you cannot shrink wrap these feathers here. I see. Because when you shrink wrap them, the, the, the shrink wrapper develops a lot of heat, and the heat actually deforms this plastic of the window because it's very large. So we had to go for uh, seals, uh, labels, you know, the sticker, yeah, the round yeah. stickers that go here and here and uh, seal the box because you cannot shrink wrap it. You know, stuff that you encounter, issues that you develop and overcome, and interesting. Yeah. Very good learning experience there. Now, you pointed at the labyrinth uh, models there. Uh, excellent segue. And, of course, that is one of the things that you have coming up that I am very excited for, for an obvious reason. The Labyrinth Adventure Game. This is the main thing I really wanted to talk to you about. Uh, what can why? you tell us about this? Yeah, but why an, why a, an obvious reason? I think that's obvious to me and you, but perhaps not to the audience. Well, um... I, I did kind of shout about this across my social media, so... I see. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to, to not uh, push that any further, I have actually contributed a guest scene to this book, so yeah, I'm very excited to see this. So, the Labyrinth Adventure Game. Can you tell us a bit more is about this, this that, book? Is this something that can be shared? Can oh. people see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, like, for example, that thing that I'm sharing at the moment. <laughs> so what is this exactly? What am I looking at? What is the this, Labyrinth Adventure game? This is your scene laid out. Yeah. You may recognize Oh, wait, it. that's my one. Oh, blimey. <laughs> yes, yes yeah, it is. That, that took me a second. <laughs> yes, it is. The stubborn sword, yeah. <laughs> I thought you might appreciate that. I'll stop sharing that. I'm sorry, but, that uh... absolutely floored me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Um... Okay. Yeah, you know, after the uh, the board game, uh, we thought of uh, what else. You know, we've done the, the last pieces, we've done expansions for the for the board game, but then we thought, wait a second, we we've done a role play game, which is actually a simple role play game aimed for beginners that don't uh, maybe haven't role played before, uh, and so we thought actually there is scope to make a simple role play game uh, for labyrinth. 
because I mean, adventuring in the labyrinth seems like a, you know, a, a great thing that people like me would love to do. Uh, you know, explore the labyrinth for yourself with your friends. So yeah. we we conceived this idea of a book. So a simple book. Obviously, this is uh, you know the. I show you the prototype super yeah. This is the equivalent of your white box. <laughs> so I this see. is the this is the first prototype of the of the book. So we went for the quality of the material. So you know, like an old uh, kind of a texture leathery, not leather. I think it's more like fabric kind of mm. feel here, and uh, and a certain level of paper weight and quality. So it looks nice and uh, you know quality and uh, heavy, and. Uh, one thing that we introduced in this, which is, I think, kind of cute. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. Yeah, with there's a, big a lot of glare. Fraction. Oh, yes. There's a hole. So in, the pages are actually have a, have a hole in them. Yeah. Yeah. I and see. the hole includes the dice. Yeah. Oh, for, yeah. For the game. So there's two dice in there, in the labyrinth, in a hole, in a, in a bit, a bit of reminiscence of the, of the oubliette. So <laughs> this will include everything you need. This, you have to imagine, use your imagination a bit, will look like the book that Sarah is holding. I see. So from the from the beginning of the movie with the red cover. Yeah. Red, the labyrinth here. Mm. Nothing. All red on the outside. And it will be will come shrink wrapped with a cardboard, you know, with all the information, the legal text. But the oops, <laughs> like helpful assistant. So yeah. imagine something that will look, you know, at the front, a bit like that. Yeah. All yeah. Excellent. And um, what's in the book? Uh, there's two things. One is about 100 scenes. Uh, each scene is a double page spread. So you open a page, you, you, are, you are in a scene, and uh, there's 100 of those. Um, and you adventure for them. You create characters, uh, which are characters from the labyrinth, or, or humans that are lost in the labyrinth. And uh, you adventure with your friends from one scene to the next. If you resolve the scene, then you can progress to a number of scenes after that, like a random number, which means that every time you play, this will change. So you will go from one scene to a different scene, every time, unless you roll the same result. But um, the feeling is that the labyrinth is a mindscape, is not a real place. Therefore, it will change and adapt every time you play. Interesting. And uh, those scenes are... Uh, set in the labyrinth uh, and as well as the hundred scenes and some tools to create more scenes to create more uh, sort of expand on the on the universe there's also a small very small set of rules which obviously you use 2d6 uh, by the way the d6 will be custom dice will not be just like those playing dice uh, but the the idea is that the rules will be so simple that a person that's never role played could pick them up and use them and just you know, don't, don't, don't be burdened by huge amounts of rules, but just go straight into the role-playing side of things. So, you know, the kind of acting type of... Uh, yeah. And on the other end, of course, the adventures, it, it's, the, 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 the scenes are simple, in, and that kind of means that if you and your group of role-players have a favorite system, whether you play D&D, &D, Cthulhu, whatever, uh, Tales of Equestria, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can actually play the, the adventure as a module with whatever rules you like. Wonderful. That's... So the idea is, yeah, either use your rules or use the rules in the book. Doesn't matter, just as long as you have fun in the labyrinth. Yeah. And when it came to write this thing, we recruited uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, people that are uh, into this kind of stuff. I think uh, <laughs> yourself included. I I am a very big fan of the La of Labyrinth movie and pretty much all of Jim Henson stuff. So uh, when I saw, I'll, I'll admit, when I saw this uh, email arrive in my inbox asking, "Hey, fancy providing whatever?" <laughs> yes, uh, it, it was quite a challenge actually writing um, a scene in in this way because it was like writing a hybrid for both a role playing game and almost a choose your own adventure game. You had to leave it open for. Uh, people to take it in whatever direction the game takes them in. Yeah, and uh, I mean the I found myself because I wrote a scene myself. Uh, yeah. The the challenge of uh, condensing a scene, the small amount of words that is required for a double page spread, is actually very interesting because you have to weigh every word very carefully. You cannot just 
keep sprawling and giving lots of information, you need to give the right amount of information, which I found very interesting as a process. Mm. Um, it reminded me of that uh, Mark Twain quote of, uh, I wanted to write you a brief letter, but I didn't have time, so I wrote you a long letter. <laughs> yeah, very, very apt, that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, uh, and, yeah, sorry, go on. No, sorry, so uh, basically, Ben Milton uh, was, is the main author, and he's written, uh, obviously, is a, is a recognized name, he's done a lot of role play supplements before, uh, adventures before, and... Uh, uh, he does a lot of uh, you know, old school uh, role play stuff, and uh, so he was uh, it was fantastic to work with. He's written the, the vast majority of the of the um, of the scenes, and and drawn the maps for the for the scenes as well, which was great. Um, but we also had guest writers, and uh, there's a few names there that people will recognize. I mean, there's like yourself, me. Uh, there's uh, uh, Matthew Worth, for example, mm. that uh, again has written novels, Black Library, etc. So there's a few recognizable names in there, um, and basically it was a great fun project to work on. It, you know, it, it, like yourself, I, I love the, sub the subject matter, so it's been a it's been fun. Mm. I, I, it, it was a definitely a fun one to to approach, but you were talking about the the mechanics there earlier. I just wanted to go back to that. The, the two dice in the, the book, it's a simple D6 uh, game. Uh, what sort of checks do you make with just the system itself? How does that play out? Well, the, the, the core mechanic is very simple. You, uh, the GM would set a, a difficulty level from like two to six, and uh, the player has to roll that difficulty level or higher to, to, to succeed. If you're particularly good at something, you get two dice and you pick the best result. If you're not very good at something, as in your characters will have skills, so will have that would be good at something, worse at something else. Uh, if you're not very good, you roll two dice and, and pick the, the lowest score. So it's extremely simple in terms of uh, yeah. mechanics of it. Yeah. Now, the of course, the player characters, that's one of the things I, I remember when you first mentioned it to me. That was something that piqued my interest, but I didn't really get a chance to explore. What characters can players uh, choose to be in this game? Oh, haha, now, list of characters. You can play as, in fact, if I bring in Jack with this one, because uh, I have to specify that the Caesars had a big uh, big hand in this, so we have Jack Caesar that uh, wrote some of the rules, uh, most of the rules indeed for, for that. Uh, and actually, Caesar, the one you know, Chris, yeah. <laughs> has drawn a lot of art for this as well, as well as laying it out. And uh, so he's there. In a way, he's also the guy that conceived the whole concept of the of the dice embedded. And so he's very much has been the project manager, the, the, the driving force behind all of this. So I thought it seems just fair to have them have a yeah. some it, some input on this as well. It, so in terms of list of playing characters, help me out, Jack. I wouldn't want to forget <laughs> any. So I will, I will, <laughs> sorry, guys. Just what I will say if. Any of you have enjoyed the Justins and Dragons uh, comics from from our on tabletop site? Chris Caesar is the guy responsible for those, which is uh, the guy just over there. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah just out of shot. There. <laughs> yeah, I've come so high. <laughs> okay, it, it's getting very crowded in the River Horse. Yay, the River Horse. Game. River Horse uh... <laughs> Hi, Chris. Okay. And of course, employee of the month. Employee of the month, yeah. So, yeah, who are some of the characters you can be in this game? Um, so, I believe there are seven uh, races, and then there is also a bit at the end that uh, if you want to play something weird, which is basically saying, hey, you know, the labyrinth's full of strange stuff. If you want to come up with your own your own idea, then go for it. But the ones sort of available are uh, is your classic human. Um, of uh, nothing super interesting, but they get extra extra talents and get to be the main character. Um, yeah. uh, you have fireys uh, who have the ability to remove their limbs, uh, very useful for problem solving. Uh, fires. And they can start, start fire. fires with their fingers as well. Um, if they ever leave their limb in the labyrinth, they uh, they don't get it back for the rest of the game, so um, oh. they need to, need to make sure they keep, uh, keep hold of all of them. Uh, there are Knights of Yore, uh, so this is sort of what uh, Sir Didymus is, mm. and uh, basically uh, they um, have the ability to find creatures in the labyrinth and ride them. So there's tons and tons of sort of interesting creatures in, in lots of the scenes, uh, giant birds, uh, spiders that can climb up walls, this sort of thing. So they all sort of have special abilities. And the Knights of Yore, sort of once you find your, your steed, 
uh, you can take that and sort of keep that for the rest of the game, um, which will give you sort of some bonuses. Uh, there are goblins, which come in all shapes and sizes. Their main ability is the fact that uh, other goblins think that they're allies. Um, so goblins are uh, ridiculous and um, constantly sort of bickering and fighting with each other, but um, they all swear allegiance to the Goblin King. They're all loyal. Um, so if you play a goblin character, then uh, you're sort of a bit of an oddity there and um, can sort of sneak around quite a lot. It's like being a good dark elf, right? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> the Trist Steward and the, <laughs> the Labyrinth. Um, there are worms. Uh, their main ability is the fact that they're very, very small um, and can climb up walls. So uh, lots of sort of stuff that would be an obstacle to bigger characters. They can just slip on, uh, slip on through. Uh, there are night trolls who uh, they, as well as being big and strong, they you also choose a thing. So it could be water, could be books, could be treasure, and um, they can summon that thing and sort of control it. Uh, so like you rocks. Choose, like rocks, rocks, yeah. If you chose rocks, then rocks. you could sort of summon rocks to your <laughs> to your aid. Rocks friends. Rocks rock friends. Friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, have we got to seven? Or have I missed? And oh, dwarves. I was afraid of forgetting. Dwarves. <laughs> so like, well, um, I'm not going to so, seven of them. Uh, dwarves are essentially the handymen of the labyrinth. Uh, they do the masonry, the gardening, the uh, plastering. So dwarves basically get a, in a lot of uh, situations and also start with some equipment for from that job. Um, Number six. Oh, God, I'm six. Dwarves, goblins, fireys. Worms? Worms. Worms. Yes. Seven. Seven. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say the worms would have been my obvious choice because I, he's only in it for like five minutes in the movie, but I love that little cockney chap. He's wonderful. Uh, but as soon as you, you mentioned a sort of troll who could control, I think you said books at one point there. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, I so... could summon books to me, my life would be complete. <laughs> You wouldn't need to go on an adventure, just yeah, just sit around. But um, yeah, so with that, um, there's a lot of stuff in the labyrinth that is basically um, because it's quite freeform, and um, uh, we've stayed away from sort of hit points and um, as far away from sort of uh, initiative orders and stuff. There is a there is an action scene sort of uh, set of the rules for you know resolving this happens, then this happens, then this happens, but. Most of the time, we try and keep it to a, um, a free-form sort of system. Uh, what that means is that uh, abilities can be very uncombat sort of uh, focused, and you never really know what's going to be useful because the labyrinth is mostly puzzles and mostly sort of very weird um, scenes. Yeah. So the fact that the worm is is like you couldn't have that in uh, in a lot of uh, games. Like you're dun been... Dungeons and Dragons, you're a tiny worm. If you're stepped on, that's uh, making your character. <laughs> <laughs> that's being stepped on. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, whereas in uh, in the labyrinth, uh, it's a bit bit kinder setting. Uh, there's not much yes. worm stepping. Lioness is most a comedy. Comedy is a lioness. Uh, so Chris, tell us yeah. how did the, the idea of the of the hole with the dice uh, come about? I have a um, I have a character for a role playing game that I do on weekends, um, and I always lose my poly set. Um, and for making prototype tokens, we have a one-inch hole punch in the office, um, which I borrowed for a weekend so that I could punch a thousand holes in my notebook, <laughs> so that my notebook would hold all of my poly set um, all the way down the long side there. Um, yeah, and oh. sort of afterwards, just like, that's so useful. Like, <laughs> I'm definitely going to try and wrangle this into a project. And then the labyrinth, it just felt like the, exactly the kind of quirky thing that, you know, the labyrinth would... Yeah. Yeah, throw out. it gives it quite a magical little um, sort of. Yeah, action. part of the part of the core concept for the book was trying to create a book that wouldn't feel out of place if you found it on the floor in the labyrinth. Yeah. Well, um, actually, I think that it does crop up in in the adventure. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you can actually come across the uh, the role playing book itself as a prop. That's very meta. Oh, that's wonderful. You can also encounter see your characters playing from. Oh, anyway, right. well, that's, that's <laughs> not a, There's a lot of few little meta things. I mean, and also that hole gives you the chance of. Uh, I mean, drives the layout of the, of the book. Has a as a thing where you can have little goblins coming out of. And um, you've been doing a lot of uh, cute little goblins uh, illustrating the, through the entire book. And I mean, just the other day. I mean, because. 
luckily for us, and maybe dauntingly for Chris, he has to share the book with like Brian Froud and, <laughs> and Johnny Cresar Allen. Whoa! Uh, Ralph Horsley. Ralph Horsley. There's a lot of uh, illustrators there that uh, really uh, have contributed well. to the book. And uh, and I have to say, just the other day, I went, oh, well, this, this, this goblin, this is a frog goblin that you, and, and actually, no, Chris had yeah. drawn that. So I was like, <gasps> Pretty smart. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he really captured the, 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 the Freudian <laughs> feel of it. And uh, so yeah, it's been too fun, I think. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, I will say when you pointed out that the hole for the dice is like the oubliette in the movie, I've I've definitely had some dice I would condemn to the oubliette. <laughs> so, or the helping hands. Hold. Yeah. So, but yeah. Oh, they creeped me out as a kid. Those hands really creeped me out as a kid. But that's why it's such a good movie. Uh, um. Those are some of the challenges people will face. Can you give us a, an idea of the threat as well? Um, you said there's no hit points in it. So what is the threat of failure in the game? So the main threat of failure is the fact that you're on a very, very strict time limit. Uh, you have 13 hours to save uh, whatever it is the Goblin King has taken. That could be uh, your baby brother. Or it could be something sort of more mystical, like your singing voice or something like that. Or a beloved pet. Or a or beloved a, pet. Or, or your car keys. <laughs> or your car keys. <laughs> mm. um, or your so, homework. Or your homework. Like in the manga. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, credit card. I mean, not so, <laughs> so you're on this strict time limit. And what that means is that um, you have this brute force solution to a lot of the problems. You know, you could spend an hour breaking through, breaking down this door. You could spend an hour sort of uh, taking some string and making your way through this hedge maze. Um, but those things take up your time. Whereas if you're able to find a sort of cunning solution or do well on the tests, then you usually find a shorter way round. Um, we also later in the book have some uh, flaws sort of you, uh, you gain and they uh, they come up. They can be a bit uh, magical, so you might become uh, very sticky, and uh, anything you touch in the rest of the game sort of sticks to you. Um, or you might turn sort of vibrant colors. Uh, so smell bad. You might smell bad uh, eternally. Uh. So yeah, it's quite uh, it's quite interesting uh, from a design perspective, uh, thinking up uh, sticks to hit the players with uh, that isn't just making their number go down. Um, there is sort of the, the big number of uh, 13 to 0. Um, but the fact that that, uh, that also sort of ties into the time of day as well. Mm. So you have 13 hours, uh, and I believe it starts at pretty much dawn and then ends sort of uh, later later at night, sort of uh, when the sun's gone down. So the last few hours of the game are sort of at night time, whereas the main game is uh, sort of during this, this day in the labyrinth. But, um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the main uh, that's the main hit that's the pressure that we yes. have. Yeah. So it was a cold grey day in the labyrinth, and the clocks were striking thirteen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if uh, I mean, and if you you know lose badly, you may end up in the oubliette and uh, and lose a lot of time in the oubliette. So yeah, the, being delayed is not good. Yeah, definitely. So, if you run out of time, the book is closed, and basically you have to make a new party to uh, to enter the labyrinth. Oh. PC is lost in the labyrinth forever. Oh, that that could be interesting. If you failed a game and you came across your your former adventuring party, yeah, lost that is it. actually one of the suggestions in the book. Is make a note of it. Feel yeah. free to put that in. <laughs> I I like that idea a lot. I like that one. So, the board game, of course, that proved very popular with uh, fans of the movies, and it's got those fantastic models sculpted by Johnny Fraser Allen. Uh, are they able to be brought into the adventure game as well, or is it entirely pen and paper focused? So there are several scenes in the um, in the book that do use um, maps might be a strong word, but there's a sort of couple of chase scenes that have uh, you sort of open the book and there's um, uh, there's squares on there that the uh, the miniatures certainly sort of add a quite labyrinthy feel. Of course, you can use coins and you know poker chips, um, but the sort of the models that we have, I think, uh, yeah, I think for role play, add a nice is, touch. role play is actually cool to have. You know, I mean, it's just to help represent visually a situation and go on, on yeah. going there and going there. So it's and I think like how um, how we said that it it kind of it works very it's easily portable with any system. Like if you're a miniatures person or a theatre of the mind person, it, it doesn't matter. Like I, I would I would definitely get a big pile of fireys and have like <laughs> yeah, 
and into a whole scene. Well, every, every scene has uh, has a map to it as well. So um, again, whether you're a theatre of the mind person and sort of just describe that that scene to the players, or whether it actually gets sort of recreated on the table, um, is is up to you and sort of your way of playing. Excellent. Okay, uh, just a couple of questions before we finish up here. First of all. Uh, what plans do you have to support the game after its release? Oh, when is it releasing? When is the final release? And one, one final point: what character do each of you plan to play in it? <laughs> Worm Barbarian. <laughs> yes, my favorite character is definitely Sadidimus, so a knight of yore would be my choice. Yes, charge! <laughs> uh, fiery with a peg leg. He's on the search for his missing leg. Ah, that's a nice one. <laughs> so when is the game set to la launch? We're trying our best to get it out for Christmas, as we said uh, before when asked. Uh, obviously, this is all subject to approval by, by the Hanson Corporation, so we are not in complete control of the, of the time frame on this project and, uh, and there's the Bowie estate for the pictures because there's a chorus section at the end with pictures as well. So, so there's obviously a degree of needs to be approved so we cannot be 100 percent sure but you know if we can bring it out in time for christmas that would be fantastic yeah excellent uh, oh sorry chris i don't think we got what your character would be worm barbarian oh yes yeah sorry okay <laughs> guys with, with a cockney accent with a, with a cockney accent of course <laughs> guys thank you very much for joining us and telling us all about these upcoming games Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Oh, thank you. Okay, if you like the sound of any of these games and want to find out more about them, please be sure to leave us a comment in below and let us know what character you would take into the labyrinth. Okay, guys, Kickstarter time. Mm -hmm. Ben, what are your picks this week? No, you have to impress me, dude. I haven't okay. been on this show for a while, so this is it. I'm expecting my socks to be blown off. Oh god, pressure. Okay, the first one. <laughs> uh, the first one of these is from a guy called Baz Stevens, who's worked on some projects in the past for a whole bunch of different companies, including including the guys at Steamforge and stuff like that. And yep. this is called The King of Dungeons. So this is a role-playing game that he is getting funded. He's got 24 days left on the campaign at the moment. It's completely funded at the moment. Mm -hmm. But he's trying to get the book off the ground for his new role-playing game. So this is a mix of the old school-style dungeon crawlers that you will have played in the past. So you like D&Ds and all that kind of thing. Yep. But also with a couple of additional modern mechanics thrown in there as well, which sounds pretty good. But the real sort of push behind this, the thing that makes it a little bit different as well, is that this is a world where adventuring is not just a calling of heroes. Adventuring is a profession. And you are part of a guild, and your guild needs to be better than the other guild at going down into sewers, killing rats, and being the ones to get all, get all the money. Murder this hobo means, is the freest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're going to be playing uh, adventurers that aren't necessarily motivated by valiant ideals or anything like that. You're adventurers who maybe they kill the big bad only because somebody paid the money to do it, which I think is great. I think it's a yeah. really fascinating sort of take on this thing, which kind of gives it that nice, really hard, grim, dark feeling to it, which I think is really, really good. Um, They've got a whole bunch of uh, interesting classes in there that you will know. They're also drawn on, or drawing, sorry, on the archetypes that you would have known. So you've got warriors and thieves, mages and clerics, all that kind of thing as well. But then this really cool aspect of this, where you're building your guild and you're sort of going out there to try and stop other guilds as well. You know, I love that idea of being the guy that is like, no, 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 we're going to undercut these guys to go and do this, but then we're going to shave some money off when we go and get the treasure and all that kind of thing and not actually give it back to the people. So you've got this kind of like good versus evil mechanic going on within your own group, which I think is really cool. But everything's a bit cutthroat so it's nice to see something that's a little bit different on that sort of the themic level which i think is really good as well as that as the title suggests you can become the king slash queen slash emperor whatever of dungeons you can eventually become the people that own the best guild in your fantasy world at going out stealing treasures defeating dragons and all that kind of thing which i think is really cool uh, the artwork for this looks really good. As I say, Baz has put a lot of effort into this one. The book looks really nice and short and simple to get stuck into, which is really good as well. So go and check this one out and see what you think. Yeah. That looks really interesting to me, actually. It does. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm a bit surprised because I, I, um, I, I'm a bit taken aback because I'll be honest, Ben, 
I thought adventuring was done for that reason all yeah. along. Yeah. <laughs> so, ideals? What, no, no, what no, ideals? No, no. There, there's a reason we're murder hobos. We move from town to town, killing everyone and taking their stuff. And then you move again before you get caught up. I, 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 there, there, must, there, there must be uh, some kind of um, a moral gap between you, you Ben, and, and myself. Because uh, really, for doing it for... And giggles was, was yeah. I thought that was I thought that was I mean, always the I mean, case. I, I think I think it all comes across in the fact that you are Warzan the Barbarian, and I have most often played but, uh, paladins and bards. So oh, clearly, yeah. I, okay. I, I am on the right yeah. Do you know what? Yeah, that, yeah. that probably that, that probably makes a lot, makes of, sense. A lot of sense. <laughs> so twenty four days left yep. on on King of Dungeons. Uh, the stuff the stuff Baz has done on has been great. I love the artwork. I think it's yeah. I think it's fabulous. Right, your second choice then. Yeah. This one this one doesn't have very long left. I'm told. No, so this one's got four days left. Uh, this is from Bad Crow Games, and this has been done in conjunction with the guys behind, at uh, Relic and Company of Heroes. So mm -hmm. if you played the old PC games for Company of Heroes, which were very, very good indeed, uh, this is a board game iteration of this on the tabletop, which sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, it can be played solo. It can be played cooperatively. It can be played competitively with up to eight players at a time, which sounds pretty good. There are four playable nations for you to get stuck into as well. So you've got Americans, British, Germans, and Soviets. It can be played in two styles either real time which is apparently very chaotic but very fun and mm. also turn based so it sort of goes back towards that sort of standard way of playing a board game which sounds pretty good as well it's very very true to the pc game so i watched a couple of previews of this to find out a little bit more about it and it sort of has this uh, the the economic engine in the background going on as you're playing the game. So you'll start off either, for example, on like side A and side B, on the opposite sides of the board. But as you go through, you'll be taking certain areas, which will then give you economic points or things that you can spend to upgrade your units. And you'll be building up your force as you go and almost entering into this meat grinder as you fight across the board to try and defeat the other person and take certain objectives and things like that. So it plays very, very much like the multiplayer version of Company of Heroes that you may have played on PC, which is very, very good. Um, also, the other thing that's really cool about this is that it has diceless combat. So this is a game that is very much driven by your strategic decisions. The dice that you see in the game are effectively there only for upgrades and for other kinds of like conditionist um, sort of effects and that kind of thing. Everything else is driven by the hard stats on your cards. So if your tanks are fighting another unit of tanks, you'll do the same damage to each other as you would based on your cards you've got there. And so you've got to make a lot of strategic decisions when it comes to like flanking enemies and that kind of thing as well. So you've got all those stuff in there in terms of like flanking rear armor front armor cover being in buildings destroying buildings all kinds of things like that it feels very interesting and evocative uh, a lot of the stuff for it is looking really good as well in terms of the quality of the components a lot of the stuff we've actually seen in the terms of the, the prototypes and things for it in some of the videos and stuff as well looks very nice even at this stage which sounds pretty good uh, but yeah a whole bunch of crazy tanks on the ta on the tabletop with all your infantry and everything as well uh, if you like company of heroes you're probably going to like this because it's very very similar to the pc game so yeah <laughs> that looks like there's a lot of potential yeah i, I worry about the real time play i as soon as he said real time i thought myself <laughs> pew, 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 you're dead. Pew, 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 you're dead. <laughs> how quickly can i move this up because obviously when you're playing on a pc the computer's doing whatever it's doing and you're moving your men and your men move as quickly as they move. Yeah. And that's all timed because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter that these guys are you being... You can't break the speed of light. Yeah. You're uh, yeah. point and click and mm. they run over there and then they're running that way and they'll meet. Whereas if your opponent's starting to move, you just go, well, you know, I can move faster than you. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting. Did you, uh, did you see any footage of the real-time play, Ben? Uh, I didn't see any footage of the real-time play. I only saw a lot of stuff to do with the turn-based stuff, but... Yeah. There are videos on there if you want to go and check it out in a little bit more detail, sort of looking at the, how that real-time aspect works. I assume a lot of people are probably going to play this in turn-based just to kind of get a grip of the mechanics and stuff. I, I but, imagine so, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> to but, just um, it, things being thrown across the table at each other anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in terms of what uh, the guys at Bad Crow said on the Kickstarter, they said that it works equally well in both real-time and turn-based. You yeah. will be the judge, of course. Obviously, do your research on Kickstarters before you back them. Uh, yes. But yeah, sounds very good indeed. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, even even if only the regular turn based one works correctly. Yeah. It shouldn't be too bad. Then you know, yeah. if if real time turns into a complete dog of a yeah a thing, you just go, Well, at least they, I've got a game I can play. Yeah. They, they've 
they, they put an interesting uh, sort of uh, infographic on the Kickstarter where it's telling sort of like exactly where it falls in sort of like the World War II on the tabletop spectrum. Mm. It's not as complicated as something like Tide of Iron, which is exceptionally complicated and it's very, very boring. It's not that complicated. It's great fun. <laughs> you said it was boring. Who told boring, you it was Jack. boring? <laughs> I have Tide and, of Iron and I have the Desert and Eastern Front expansions. It's a great game. Yeah, and then you see them all getting sold at the Bring and Buy place. Still, in, you don't see it sold anywhere. <laughs> It's Anybody who's trying to get well, it's hands gone, on it, yeah, yeah, it's very expensive. Uh, to buy. But then you've got sort of like Memoir 44 on the other end of the scale. This is kind of like up here, sort of like so it's it's quick and easy to play, but it's got crunchy sides to it as well. Yeah. So yeah. It sounds pretty good. I like the economic aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, economics that's the cool thing about it. So uh, yeah. economics um, and resource. Uh, resource yeah. allocation and management is something that I've yeah. often wondered: do, is it ever going to make it into the the war games in yeah. any meaningful sense? Because, yeah. um, you know, a lot of us uh, will remember back to the dawn of war days. Yeah, you know, a lot of hobbyists came in from dawn of war uh, well, over into the forty k stuff. And Red, Red, Redica, the guys that actually made dawn of war, and that system is what was used from Company of mm. Heroes and used with this. So I could see this easily being reskinned for other games as well, yeah. like forty k and that kind of thing. But so. uh, but uh, I would like to see. Um, uh, an economic um, or resource allocation model, uh, model yeah. that, uh, design that could even be layered on to games, you know, so that um, as you, you capture something or as you sacrifice something, you can you could call in reinforcements mm. or build something that then builds yeah. that then generates something. I would I would love to see that make it. Uh, make it into the tabletop. The difficulty with it is, is most tabletop games last five turns or six turns. Yeah. And it's very difficult to have any kind of meaningful um, resource generation kind of a thing when you only have six turns yeah. to the, decide a game. The, there are games out there that use it, but they use it in combination with a campaign system. Yes, yeah. Because think, then you, you've got the weeks slash months that you're playing the campaign to actually work yeah. that out. I mean, been, sorry, go sorry I was going to say, I think that's where these kind of like hex and counter style games work better for that format because yeah. it's not necessarily just uh, done by fixed turns anymore. Mm. It's driven by holding certain objectives on the tabletop or meeting other victory conditions and i think that's where you need to see a switch and enable to sort of like enable that an economic aspect to come in some bright spark out there will be able to do it because maybe they'll they'll do it between unit activations yeah. instead of mm. you know, yeah you know, yeah if you do it between unit activations you've maybe 30 opportunities in a game to do it um you know instead of five mm. opportunities to do it um yeah. so yeah some bright spark will do it right guys that's your lot join us for backstage uh tomorrow um where uh myself jerry and maybe justin if we can get him come back from his holidays um <laughs> can sit down and have a have a smooth relaxing chin wag about um all things hobby related um uh, we the winners have been announced or the winners are up um, in the prize centre for the Parabellum uh, War Games Mystery Sprue and the Escape the Dark Castle bundle. Um, uh, so if you're uh, if you're interested, head across to the prize centre. Remember, prizes need to be claimed within thirty days. Right, guys, thank you so much. Um, always a pleasure. Um, yeah, we will see you next week. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.